Hi guys. In order to keep the show ad free and increase the frequency of production, donations are a big help. Some of you have been very generous in donating, and I appreciate it greatly. If you could give to the show's Patreon account, it would result in good karma and buttress the show's prospects. The URL is www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash leader one, L-E-A-D-E-R-O-N-E, www.patreon.com slash leader one. Thank you so much. so scared. All I wanted to do was play with you. Please come and play with me. I'm so lonely. You're not afraid of the dark, are you? Don't be afraid. Come with me. I will show you where I play hide and seek. Do you want to play hide and seek? You hide and I'll find you. This episode is dedicated to Glenn Ellerman. Thanks for the cornbread, man. This episode will be divided into two sections. First, I will tell the story of Ed Kemper's life story leading up to and detailing the murders he committed. The second half will feature excerpts from his confessions to the police, which were recorded on audio tape. The statements attributed to him are his remarks transcribed verbatim. Edmund DeMille Kemper III was born in Burbank, California on December 18, 1948. His parents were Clarnell Elizabeth and Edmund DeMille. His father was a military veteran and an electrician. Unlike his dynamic and valiant war hero father, His mother felt perennially defeated and ungrateful. Her presence in their home was frequently tiresome due to her constant complaining. She was critical of her husband for choosing a profession she considered to be menial. Regardless of the extensive training and concentrated dedication, he invested in becoming a knowledgeable and highly skilled professional. Clarnell was deeply depressed and was always sure to establish that state of affairs as common knowledge among everybody who entered her orbit. Commenting on the domestic atmosphere that Clarnell contaminated with the manifestations of her toxic outlook, Edmund Sr. once said, Suicide missions in wartime and the atomic bomb testings were nothing compared to living with her. More than 396 days and nights fighting on the front did. Edmund Jr. would also come to resent his mother. Clarnell went out of her way to rob their lives of any joy that would have come their way, and it was a habit she never broke. It was something Jr. was unable to forget. Edmund Jr. was nicknamed Guy by his parents. Clarnell did not enjoy motherhood, finding it burdensome. She described Edmund as a handful. From the age of four onward, it became clear that Edmund was no ordinary boy. For one thing, he was a foot taller than his kindergarten classmates. The imbalances within him were not purely hormonal. Something afflicted him neurologically as well, because he developed a predilection for torturing and murdering animals. Any criminologist will tell you that this pathology and behavior is not uncommon among serial killers. Before he began murdering human beings, Jeffrey Dahmer would dissect animals and bleach their bones methodically with the purpose of retaining them as gruesome mementos of an inner world he would discover before he forged his own key to those gates at the pre-mortem phase. As a miner, Dahmer was a scavenger. Ed Kemper was both executioner and undertaker. He buried his family's cat alive. He waited a few days to dig it out so that it would die before he could exhume the body and dismantle it. 
He cut its head off and mounted it on a spike. He enjoyed lying to his family, and they didn't learn the truth about the demise of their pet for some time. The day would come when he would gladly describe his crimes in merciless graphic detail. The time would come, but it had to wait. Three years after killing his first cat, he killed its replacement. In a rage fueled by jealousy when the new cat bonded with his sister, Alan, he dispatched the cat to the grave, where it would no longer have the freedom to deprive him of its company. He cleaved its skull to have a look at its brain. He stabbed it and stabbed it until it bled out the last vestiges of its life. He dismembered it and kept some components as souvenirs. He kept them in the rear of his closet. Disturbed by her son's behavior, Clarnell relegated him to the basement, feeling her daughters would be safer if he lived down there. The entrance was a trap door situated beneath the kitchen table. She would lock it. Her concern was well-founded. Aside from what he did to the cats, he also manifested homicidal ideation with his sister's toys. He would dismember their heads and hands. Once, when he attended a carnival for children, he spotted a toy guillotine that became an obsession. These fixations were unrelenting. His sister Susan was able to find some humor in it, especially when she said to him, How come you don't try to kiss your teacher? His response, if I kiss her, I'd have to kill her first. She may have been referring to his second grade teacher. Kemper was a peeping Tom, and he would watch her through her windows, his father's war-era bayonet in his hands. Ed's favorite childhood games were called Electric Chair and Gas Chamber. Electric Chair consisted of getting Alan to slip the switch after tying him up with rope. He would gyrate and flail from the chair to the floor, as one would if they were electrocuted. Preparations were underway for both crime and punishment. One day his sister pushed him into the deep end of a swimming pool. He nearly drowned. Another time she tried to push him in the path of an oncoming train. There were no retaliations for these actions. So he was likely eager to traverse the hinterlands of mortality while teetering perilously close to death. A chip appeared on Edmund's shoulder at this stage of his life, and few would have been able to reach it. He was becoming very tall. His school peers taunted him without mercy. He wasn't spared this ridicule on the domestic front either. His mother would make fun of him, calling him a circus freak. His mother and father became estranged, and they separated in 1957. She hated being a single mother with an involved father and husband in the house. Now she was doing it on her own, while working full-time as a secretary, and she was livid. She forced Edmund to sell newspapers on a street corner. He was under strict orders to sell every single copy, and if he could not, he need not bother coming home. His father was outraged when he heard about this, and he brought Edmund home. Junior could not count on his father to come to the rescue much after that. He admired his father to the point of hero worship. He loved to pour over his father's guns and medals. The sadness he felt in the void his father left behind was soon displaced by a fascination with guns. Edmund took up the sport of marksmanship, and he fired with surgical precision. Feeling empowered by shooting firearms was frequently set off by his mother's tendency to emasculate him. Clarnell turned to alcohol to cope with the demise of her marriage, and during her drunken stupors, she would tell Junior that he reminded her of her failed marriage to his father. Though an outcome of a reproductive success, she also viewed him as a genetically tainted failure spawned of a broken marriage. In her myopic view, he had only come that far. Though his father didn't exactly approve of the fact that he was incarcerated in the basement of his mother's home, he did nothing to emancipate Ed from the situation. At the age of 15, Ed was six foot four. His resentment toward his mother also increased in size. 
branching out from resentment, was homicidal ideation. He created what he referred to as a death list. The victims indexed in this document were friends of his mother's. He included personal details of each individual, including changes in surname and mailing addresses following marriage. Ed's mother and father formalized their divorce in September 1961. Clarnell was awarded custody of all three children. They moved to Helena, Montana. Before long, she married Norman Turnquist. He was a plumber. For some reason, it didn't bother her that her new husband was a blue-collar tradesman like Edmund Sr. Norman reached out to Edmund, making an effort to compensate for the lack of a father figure in his life. He took him hunting and fishing in an attempt to establish a bond. However well they got on, it was not enough to endear Norman to Edmund. Edmund fantasized about bashing Norman's brains in with an iron bar. The idea was that after leaving Norman lying in a pool of his own blood, he would steal his car and drive to Southern California to live with his father. The temptation was fierce, with Edmund standing behind Norman, poised and ready to pound him. But Edmund just could not bring himself to do it, and he lowered the bar. Norman would likely learn years later of what might have become of him had he suffered the same fate as one of Edmund's victims. Edmund decided it would be more satisfying to choose a victim that could not engage him in combat, someone much weaker. A female would be ideal, according to his logic. His sexuality and perception of women was informed by contempt and violent impulses. As the only male in a household dominated by women, he was outnumbered, but not outmatched in strength and capacity for violence. By this point, his sexual proclivities were intertwined with violent pathology, and he posed a danger to the women in his family. If they were aware of the threat, it was one they would have been well advised to take seriously. At the age of 13, he was accused of shooting a dog in his neighborhood. He was ostracized and cast out by the boys. His family and closest friends also distanced themselves from him. There was no evidence that he was guilty of the act, but he was known for killing and torturing animals. So the court of public opinion's verdict was guilty, and he was sentenced to exile. Like swamp water, Ed's fantasy world would run rancid as it was left undisturbed. Keeping his fantasies a secret ensured he was protected from the condemnation of others. In 1963, at the age of 14, Ed ran away from home. He took his mother's car and drove it until it ran out of gas. He boarded a bus. Destination, Los Angeles. Objective, reunite and live with his father. While he was in California, Clarnell searched his closet and was discomfited by what she found. He never threw out the cat's remains. There was also some blood-stained clothing. She wrote him a letter wherein she asked him if he was responsible for the acts that led to the state of these materials. He was indignant, denying both accusations. Pivotal changes also occurred in Ed's father's life. He remarried and welcomed a stepson into his home. He established a new bond with Edmund and agreed to let him live in their house. Ed's stepmother was named Alfreda, and it wasn't long before Ed's presence gave her the creeps. He caught a glimpse of her in the nude one day, and he developed an obsessive sexual attraction to her. She asked him to leave one day, and he, when he refused, his stepbrother chased him out of the house, wielding a hammer. During the Christmas season, Ed's father took them all to visit Ed's grandparents. Ed was left to stay with them. His father's explanation was that he could not afford to support him. Ed did not enjoy living with his grandparents. She was as domineering as his mother, and it was very difficult for him to tolerate. He moved to California to escape that dynamic, and now it manifested in a different woman. His life was bookended by the two women, and he had no alternate address at which to set up camp. His mother didn't want him anyway, not after finding the remains of the cat in his closet. His father didn't want him either. Clarnell called Edmund Sr. one night 
and warned him that sending Ed to live with his grandparents put their safety at risk. She pointed out that he was unpredictable, a real weirdo, and opined that he had real homicidal tendencies. She told him there was a very real possibility that he might learn one morning that Ed killed them both. Edmund brushed this off and hung up, going back to sleep. August 1964. Ed's grandmother, Maud, was sitting at the kitchen table, writing. His grandfather, Edmund I, went on a grocery run. Ed sat down with Maud, and soon after they began to argue. They had very little in common. She hoped to make a man out of him somehow. He suggested that buying him a hunting rifle would occupy him as he made his rounds on their farmland. He was informed that he could kill mammals, but never birds. Ed considered his grandfather to be a bit of a dullard, predictable, and devoted to running errands and other practicalities. His wife made him miserable. Ed felt little more than contempt for the both of them, and he was eager to defy them both. After finishing junior high, Ed returned to his mother in Montana. A storm was brewing inside of him, and his disposition forecasted an ominous front emerging from behind the horizon. Maud pushed this process forward, constantly scolding him. She assumed tough love would be the remedy for what ailed him. It came to a head one day that month after he announced he was going hunting. She admonished him, warning him not to shoot birds. Ed was fed up with her shit. Ed retrieved his rifle and returned to the kitchen. He pointed his double-barrel shotgun at her head and shot her. A mist of blood sprayed out of a large, gaping wound and spattered the closest wall. He shot her twice in the back, pumping out bloody sludge projectiles from the other side of her torso. Determined to eliminate any uncertainty about her condition, he grabbed a large kitchen knife and stabbed her repeatedly. Maud became a fountain of blood. Ed was amazed by the ocean of gore that swept across the floor in high tide. He wrapped her head in a towel. He dragged her corpse to the bedroom. Suddenly he heard the unmistakable sound of his grandfather's car pulling up in the driveway. Ed went out to the car, rifle in hand. His grandfather opened the door of the car to enable Ed to grab the groceries and bring them to the kitchen. This was purely presumptuous on his part. His grandfather didn't make it that far. Ed's idea of mercy was to kill his grandfather to spare him the heroin visage of his wife marinating in her own blood. Ed raised the rifle and turned his grandfather's lights out with one lethal shot to his head, execution style. His grandfather didn't live to hear the shot that killed him. Ed dragged his corpse into the garage and shut the door. Concerned, the neighbors heard the shots that sprayed his grandparents' innards about the property. Ed sprayed the yard with water from a garden hose until the blood seeped into the soil. Ed discharged his rage with the bullets and now he felt vulnerable and afraid. He was not a seasoned criminal, benefiting from the wisdom of an advisory board of studied and experienced offenders. This was his first serious crime, and it was a doozy. Double homicide. Premeditated in the first degree. He didn't know how he was going to get out of that situation. Shooting his way out was one option if the police showed up, but they were bound to outshoot him with their mammoth stockpile of ammunition as they outnumbered him in personnel. Fortunately for his sake, he was alone, and it was easier to sort things out while there was no one in his orbit to panic and become hysterical. He decided to call the one person who might advise him on the best thing to do, and it was the person he despised more than anyone. He called his mother. The one woman who herself was lucky not to catch a bullet that day, benefiting not from her son's second thoughts, but from the geographical separation that kept her out of his crosshairs. He told her what happened, though he altered the story, telling her it was accidental. She didn't buy this for a second. For many years, the question in her mind wasn't, will he? It was, when will he? She was no psychic, 
but she didn't have to be to predict this event after observing his off-putting behavior for so many years. She told him to call the Madera County Sheriff's Office. She insisted that he give them a full and truthful confession. Within the hour, police showed up and found Ed Kemper sitting on the porch. They asked him for a motive. Ed said, I don't want to live with either of my parents, and I don't like living at North Fork. The officers probed for specifics, and he delivered. I just wanted to see what it would be like to kill my grandmother. He backed this up by telling them he had been contemplating that action for a long time. One officer asked, Why your grandpa then? Ed said, I didn't want Grandpa to see his wife dead and have a heart attack and die. Ed mentioned he was mad at the world, but did not want to move back to his father's home. The officers arrested Kemper and took him to the station. Fifteen-year-old, six-foot-four-inch Edmund Kemper was booked on suspicion of murdering his grandparents. The authorities received a phone call from Clarnell. She told them Ed called her and confessed to the murders. Ed said he shot and stabbed his grandmother because he, quote, did not want her to suffer, end quote. Chief Deputy William Helms sized up Ed Kemper, remembering him as highly intelligent but emotionally disturbed. A closed hearing in the juvenile court was held on September 22nd. A newspaper headline read, Judge Way's Fate of Young Slayer. Kemper was remanded to the California Youth Authority for a then undetermined amount of time. Psychiatric testing was ordered by the judge. He underwent that testing at CYA's Perkins Reception Center at Sacramento. There it was decided where he would be sent for testing and observation. He was admitted to Atascadero on December 6, 1964. He underwent a rigorous program of psychological assessments. Court psychiatrists diagnosed him as a paranoid schizophrenic, but California Youth Authority psychiatrists and social workers disagreed with this judgment. Still, there was clearly something wrong with him. A diagnosis would elude them for some time. Throughout interviews, they found, quote, no flight of ideas, no interference with thought no expression of delusions or hallucinations, and no evidence of bizarre thinking, end quote. They asked him if he felt remorse about his actions. Finally, they saw a definitive sign that all was not right in the brain of Ed Kemper. He told them he resented the fact that he didn't undress his grandmother. He didn't elaborate, so it is not known if he would have liked to disrobe her before or after the murder. They observed that he was intelligent and introspective. His IQ test score was 136, over two standard deviations above average. Further insight into his emotions and thoughts led to a diagnosis of a, quote, personality trait disturbance, passive-aggressive type, end quote. He underwent another IQ test later while evaluated at this facility and his result that time was around 145. They did determine that he was sporadically psychotic. They said he was, quote, confused and unable to function, end quote. They suspected his psychosis distorted his perception of women, and that his mother was to blame. To quote the report, he is a psychotic and danger to himself and others. He may well be a very long-term problem. Kemper presented as highly passive to an unnatural degree. He lived in fear of being harmed by the other boys. His judgment was poor. The only reason he hadn't committed suicide was that he didn't want others to clean up the same mess he left behind when he killed his grandparents. Talk about irony. Kemper was highly regarded as a patient. He accomplished this status by becoming the epitome of a model prisoner because of his high intelligence, he underwent training to evaluate other prisoners with psychiatric tests. To quote one of his psychiatrists, he was a very good worker, and this is not typical of a sociopath. He really took pride in his work.
Kemper even added some of his own innovations to the tests. He didn't do this work entirely out of an eagerness to please his handlers, however. Through developing an advanced understanding of psychiatric testing, he learned how to manipulate psychiatrists. He also gleaned some valuable data from his sex offender friends. For example, he was advised to always kill women after raping them to avoid leaving witnesses. As their student, he was diligent and a receptive listener. December 18, 1969. Ed Kemper was 21 years old, and the young man who killed both his grandparents because he didn't want to live with them anymore was released to the world. His psychiatrists were opposed to the idea of releasing him into the care of his mother, who could blame them. Kemper manipulated the doctors into convincing them he was rehabilitated. On November 29, 1972, his juvenile records were expunged. This is an extract written by his probation psychiatrists at that time. If I were to see this patient without having any history available or getting any history from him, I would think that we're dealing with a very well-adjusted young man who had initiative, intelligence, and who was free of any psychiatric illnesses. It is my opinion that he has made a very excellent response to the years of treatment and rehabilitation, and I would see no psychiatric reason to consider him to be of any danger to himself or to any member of society. And since it may allow him more freedom as an adult to develop his potential, I would consider it reasonable to have a permanent expunction of his juvenile records. While staying with his mother, he honored his vow to the probation authorities to take construction action toward embarking on a career. He attended community college with the intention of becoming a police officer. He was rejected because of his height. He was six foot nine by then. He acquired the nickname Big Ed. Though his dreams of becoming a badge were dashed, he sought out the company of police officers nonetheless. He would frequent a bar called the Jury Room, which was popular with off-duty cops. Ed worked a few menial jobs before he was hired by the State of California Division of Highways. His relationship with his mother, as predicted by doctors, was hostile and toxic. Their arguments were so heated and loud their neighbors could hear. Kemper described these quarrels. My mother and I started right in on horrendous battles, just horrible battles, violent and vicious. I've never been in such a vicious verbal battle with anyone. It would go to fists with a man, but this was my mother, and I couldn't stand the thought of my mother and I doing these things. She insisted on it, and just over stupid things. I remember one roof razor was over whether I should have my teeth cleaned. Kemper turned to the only practical resolution to withdraw from this contentious situation. He moved in with a friend in Alameda, California. Still, his mother wouldn't let up. She would call him or pay surprise visits. It didn't help that he struggled financially and would often return to her place when he was too destitute to carry on independently. In 1973, Kemper became engaged to a girl who was a student in high school at the time. The engagement was terminated after his second arrest. Her parents requested that her name be withheld from the public. Kemper was hired by the State of California's Highway Division. That same year, Kemper bought a motorcycle. He was hit by a car one day. His arm was badly broken. He filed a civil suit against the driver and received a settlement of $15,000, approximately $87,021. He bought a car with the money, and he noticed several attractive young women hitchhiking. Inspired, he packed his car with plastic bags, knives, blankets, and handcuffs. At first, he would just pick them up and drop them off at their stated destinations, as promised. He picked up an estimated 150 female hitchhikers at this time. Something was boiling up from within him, what he called his, quote, little zapples, end quote. If you are a criminologist or a psychologist, you would more likely label them homicidal sexual urges. Unaware at the time, 
the field was about to become more competitive for the likes of Ted Bundy, thanks to Edmund Kemper. May 7, 1972. Ed Kemper picked up two 18-year-old hitchhikers, students Anne P.C. and Anita Mary Lucessa. They requested a ride to Stanford University, and he assured them he would take them there. After driving for an hour, Kemper came upon a secluded forest near Alameda, California. He knew it well due to his work with the highway department. He altered his course from the direction that would have taken them to Stanford. Having arrived at a site he deemed as suitably isolated, he handcuffed Anne and locked Anita in the trunk. He stabbed Anne and strangled out every last breath. He dispatched Anita using identical tactics. Kemper would later comment on the experience of killing Anne P.C., saying that while she was handcuffed, he, quote, brushed the back of my hand against one of her breasts, and it embarrassed me. He even said something to the effect of, whoops, I'm sorry. More irony from the man who could kill other human beings as if they were domestic vermin, but could barely negotiate the terrain of sexual interaction, even when it was unintentional. Ed put both corpses into the trunk of his car and drove back to his apartment. He was pulled over by a police officer along the way. The car had a broken taillight, but the cop did not see fit to search the trunk for any reason, so Kemper was permitted to continue on his journey. Another stroke of luck manifested in the form of his roommate's absence. Kemper brought the corpses into the apartment, where he took photos of them. From there, he copulated with each lifeless body, hot flesh pressing against the frigid rigidity of rigor mortis. After his climax, the denouement of this chapter in his story ended when he cut each body into fragments, which were put into trash bags and dumped near Loma Prieta Mountain. Before he tossed their heads into a ravine, he degraded their bodies one last time by filling their mouths with his penis, an act otherwise known as irumatio, or Egyptian rape. In August, Anne Pisi's skull was found. It was only identified after being hers after an exhaustive autopsy. Authorities searched the area for the rest of her remains, but were unable to find them. The same was true of Anita Lachesa. September 14, 1972. Ed Kemper picked up another hitchhiker, 15-year-old Aiko Ku, who was en route to a dance class and had missed her bus. He drove her to a remote location. He pulled a gun on her. This wasn't much help to him since he accidentally locked himself out of his car. Ku let him back in since he gained her trust using his knowledge and skills in psychological manipulation. Once he got back in the car, he choked her until she was unconscious. She was still breathing while he raped her. Recalling advice from his sex offender mentors, he killed her. He put her body in the trunk of the car and went to a bar to have a few drinks. After he left the bar, he opened the trunk of his car and examined the fruit of his labors. Aiko was neglected of the nourishment of a beating heart for so long she was now relegated to fermentation at the infancy of its progress. In retrospect, Kemper remarked on the pride this brought to him, saying that when he viewed Aiko's remains, he was, quote, admiring my catch like a fisherman, end quote. At the apartment, it was sheer necrophiliac bliss. Before he dismantled her corpse and disposed of the dismembered parts in different locations. Ku's mother reported her daughter's disappearance to the police. She posted hundreds of flyers around town in hopes that someone would come forward with information regarding her whereabouts. Hoping the community would be fertile with an outgrowth of promising leads, it proved to be a veritable moonscape. January 7, 1973. Kemper had moved back in with his mother by this point. Still unable to subdue his homicidal impulses, he picked up 18-year-old Cindy Shaw at the campus of Cabrillo College. He drove her to an isolated wood. He shot her with a 22 caliber pistol. He put her in the trunk of his car and drove her to his mother's house. He stored her corpse in the closet of his bedroom overnight. 
After his mother departed for work in the morning, he fornicated with Cindy's corpse. He removed the bullet that robbed her of the personal autonomy that would have denied Ed the power he now had over her body. After defiling her, he dismembered her in the bathtub. He made a point of disconnecting her head. Ed kept Cindy's head for several days. He fucked her mouth compulsively, exhilarated by the thrill of doing so, until he wasn't. As a necrophile, his intensity was not commensurate with his longevity, and his victims expired in appeal and composition, like all perishable goods. After several days of filling Cindy's mouth with his penis, he had had his fill of the experience, and he buried her head in his mother's garden. He made a point of aiming the face in the direction of his mother's bedroom window. When asked about his motivation for taking this action, he said he did it because his mother, quote, always wanted people to look up to her, end quote. He flung the other portions of Cindy's body off a cliff. All the parts except for the head and right hand were discovered and brought to the attention of law enforcement. A pathologist described the autopsy, a pathologist described the autopsy as a process akin to piecing together a macabre jigsaw puzzle. Her fingerprints were taken from her severed hand, which had washed up at a beach. His conclusion was that the body was dissected with a power saw. February 5, 1973. Ed got into a heated argument with his mother. He decided to blow off steam in his customary way by finding his next victim. He hadn't been able to silence his mother, but he knew a decapitated head wouldn't give him any attitude. It wasn't as easy to find victims now. Authorities notified the public that a possible serial killer was preying on female hitchhikers and that they were advised to only accept rides from cars with university stickers on them. These stickers were not easy for most people to come by since they were only distributed to members of staff in the student body. Clarnell worked for the University of California, Santa Cruz. Ed met 23-year-old Rosalind Thorpe and 20-year-old Allison Liu on the UCSC campus. As Kemper described it, Rosalind, the more adventurous of the two, got in first and reassured Allison that it was safe to enter. Having found a spot that was secluded, he shot both girls with his twenty-two pistol and wrapped them in blankets. Kemper approached the handling of these corpses differently than with the others. Before bringing them in the house, he beheaded them in the car. He brought the headless cadavers into the house, where he debased both bodies as he raced the clock to relieve himself of his lust, before the color and stench of putrefaction was sure to manifest. With his sexual needs having been accommodated, he dismembered the bodies. He removed the bullets to circumvent identification, as his fingerprints were left on each round while loading the pistol. He disposed of their remains at Eden Canyon, and they were found a week later. More were discovered at Highway 1 in March. Police Lieutenant Charles Scherer speculated that all three victims were killed by the same person, since they were slaughtered with the same methodical approach, including decapitations, in every case. April 20th, 1973. Late at night, Clarnell came home from a party and woke Ed after arriving. Later, she was in bed reading when Ed came into her room. She was nonplussed to see him and said, I suppose you're going to want to sit up all night and talk now. Ed said, No, good night. He waited for her to fall asleep. Assured that she was unconscious, Ed returned to her room with a claw hammer and a knife. He bludgeoned her with the hammer, the thuds landing against her skull as the last and only lullaby she would hear at that stage of her life. That is, if she woke in time to feel the impact of the damage to her brain. He slit her throat with a knife. He stuck her like a pig and bled her out enough to ensure the blood loss killed her in Congress with the neurological mutilation. He pushed his blade into the wound in her neck. It was wide and deep enough to fashion a Cuban necktie. 
Instead, he cut deeper, sawing through her neck and cartilage through to the other side. With little left but connective tissue, he yanked her head off, literally cutting himself free of these family ties. Showing neither favor nor ambivalence in comparison with his other victims, he fucked Clarnell's head in the mouth. After this, he used it as a dartboard. It is unknown which part of her head and face served as the bullseye. When he wasn't pelting her severed head with darts, he was screaming at it. At the risk of stating the obvious, this was personal. He said he also, quote, smashed her face in, though he didn't specify what this entailed exactly. He did mention that he cut out her tongue and larynx and put them down the garbage disposal. The garbage disposal proved to be no match for the vocal cords, and it spat them back out into the sink. Reflecting on this, Kemper said, that seemed appropriate. As much as she'd bitched and screamed and yelled at me over so many years, he finally got her to shut the fuck up for good. And yet, anatomically speaking, her annoying voice wouldn't go down without a fight. Kemper concealed his mother's corpse in a closet. He went out to a bar. When Ed returned home from the bar, he invited his mother's best friend over. Her name was Sally Taylor, 59 years old. The plan was to have dinner and watch a movie. Hallett accepted, but without seeing a single frame of film, a horror scene played out when Kemper strangled her to death. He cleaned up after the murder to erase any indicators of foul play. He left this note for the police. Approximately 5.15 a.m., Saturday. No need for her to suffer any more at the hands of this horrible, murderous butcher. It was quick, asleep, the way I wanted it. Not sloppy and incomplete, gents. Just a lack of time. I got things to do. Ed left the scene. He drove all the way to Pueblo, Colorado, without stopping. It was a thousand-mile drive, and he took caffeine pills to stay awake. Among the belongings he packed were three guns and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. He believed that at that point, the police must have initiated a manhunt. He listened to the radio news reports carefully, keenly awaiting bulletins regarding the deaths of his mother and Sally. When he arrived in Pueblo, he still hadn't heard anything. He went to a phone booth and called the police. He confessed to both murders. The police didn't take him seriously. They told him to call back later. He called them hours later and asked to speak to an officer he knew personally. He confessed to him. The police came and took him into custody, whereupon he confessed to the murders of the six students. This is what Kemper had to say about his decision to turn himself in. The original purpose was gone. It wasn't serving any physical or real or emotional purpose. It was just a pure waste of time. Emotionally, I couldn't handle it much longer. Toward the end there, I started feeling the folly of the whole damn thing, and at the point of near exhaustion, near collapse. I just said to hell with it and called it all off. April 24th, 1973. This is the transcript from Ed Kemper's first confession. It took place at the Santa Cruz Sheriff's Department. He was interviewed by Lieutenant Charles Scherer. All right, now we get through Tharp. Now let's get into Lou again. When you fired the shot into Tharp. Yes, and she slumped over. Miss Lou panicked and she went unconscious, but she was making a very strange sound. I almost threw up as we were going down the hill. It was a sigh, a constant over and over sigh. This was after the shooting? Yeah. Would you describe the shooting again? With her, I fired the first time, and it went through her hand. She was moving around quite rapidly, trying to get away from the gun, because I had to fire right-handed because of the cast, or in both cases, I would have fired left-handed. It was awkward in both cases. I had to turn it around like this, so I was at a bad angle with her, and I missed. They were bad shots the first two times. But the third shot, I moved it almost out of my hand, and around at a direct angle. 
The first shot through her hand missed her head completely, and the second one grazed her head and also went through her hand and embedded itself in the car and ricocheted back out the front. Then the third shot, I was positive that she was unconscious, but I really don't think I needed to do that. She was very slumped over in the seat, and she was scrunched way down in the seat and was only maybe two-thirds the height up off the seat. So, her head was not visible above the cushion like it normally would be. So I just put the coat over her and grabbed the blanket and unfolded it enough. And I tried to push Miss Thorpe over down into the floorboard area, and she wouldn't budge. She was just sitting there, slumped over completely. And so finally, I just pulled her over sideways on the seat and put the blue velveteen sort of blanket over her and made sure it stayed below the level of the windows there and that it wasn't an obvious shape or anything. I kept it double thickness and just opened it enough so it looked like a flat blue surface and started and continued right down the hill and never hit the brakes actually, maybe only once or twice when I reached back. Right after I put the blanket over Miss Thorpe, a car came down. So I smoothly accelerated so there wouldn't be a blast of gas and a jerk or anything. So, I'm sure to them it appeared as if I was just cruising along. They came down behind us, and I came right down in front of the guard station at the bottom, where the cars were parked and everything, and there were two guards standing right by the road out there having a little conversation. They were maybe 20 feet from the car, on their side of the car. Yeah, it was a sigh, a very strange sigh. It would, it would start out very sharp, almost like a snuffle. And then it would taper off and a little bit more like a masculine sigh than a fine girl, petite type of girl like she was. It wasn't low or anything, but it was very disconcerting and it was constant. After we stopped and went on down bay, obviously there was quite a bit of blood because of the wounds. And there was blood from that last hole in the forehead. Just a second. You made a stop where? Right by the guards. I made a stop right next to the guards and they glanced over and were talking. I stopped right there at the stop sign and continued right down bay. What were your movements from there? I went straight down to Mission, turned right and headed out on Highway 1, making sure I broke absolutely no rules and was doing my damnness to look cool while I was freaking out about Alice Lou in the back seat there, which I'm sure she was unconscious. At first, I didn't think so, and I made a couple of loud statements and just continued right on through. So I knew she was unconscious, but the blood started running and started gurgling, and the sighing was still there. So as soon as I got out to the edge of town, I stepped on the gas and got the hell away from there and a little farther down the road, where no cars were coming. I slowed down very slow, turned her head around to the side, and fired point-blank at the side of her head. The reason she didn't go instantly like the Thorpe girl was that the automatic had a kind of a quirky ramp, and it would not. You couldn't load all the points into the clip, or I would have always used those. I could only put one in the barrel and nine regular solid headlong rifles in the clip, and everything I fired at Miss Lou was solids. So that one solid slug she got in there, and she was doing the moaning. I got out of town and turned her head to the side and fired point blank, and the flash was so great that I could see some of the tissue coming out. She stopped immediately. Silence. Then I turned back around about two seconds later, and then started up again, and it was really getting to me. So there's a place down the road. You know that popular beach area where the sign is, like it says Davenport and all that, Bonnie Dune, etc.? A lot of people park there. Well, the next one back from there is the loop. Some people get on that and think they're going to Bonnie Doon, and it loops right back out. Laguna. Yeah, I circled back down through that and went up on that little cul-de-sac up in there. I had the parking lights on, jumped out, and put both of them in the trunk. Unfortunately, Miss Thorpe was very hard to handle. She didn't look as heavy as she was at all. As I was moving her and trying to get her up over into the trunk, she slipped and came down and landed on her left side. I picked her back up and pushed her on in. I just dragged Miss Lou and put her in and her back up and pushed her on in. I just dragged Miss Lou and put her in and lost a shoe doing so and went back and got it. 
I was very careful about things like that because I knew that those were the details that get people every time. Also, I heard a plastic bag underneath the car blow out of the car as I pulled around and it had blood on it. It was a blue laundry bag, so I reached under the car and fished that out and put it back in. But it rained later that night, so anything that had been there would probably have been destroyed as far as evidence. But I told them both in the trunk, drove home, and went in the house. I had told her I'd gone to the movie. So I came home and by this time... After you loaded them into the truck, did you go straight home? Straight home. Did you talk to your mother as soon as you got home? Yep. I went home and what I did was I walked straight in and I noticed as I got into the light there... Oh, wait a minute. I stopped at the Freddy's Fast Gas on the left there, coming back into town. There was a Chinese girl pumping gas. I went into the restroom and cleaned off as much of the cast as I could because it was a new cast and a little bit off my pants. To myself, I called them my murder clothes, because it was these dark pants. They were dark blue denim western type pants, with very, very light, not quite white markings, but they were very dark. That was in case I got them splattered. I used them on the first two girls. I think I used them when Aiko Ku and Cynthia Shaw were killed. I'm not sure, but in the vast majority of the cases, I used those pants and shirt. The shirt is still at home, and I know it has some stains in it, but they look more like rust stains than blood. What happened when you got home? Well, I stayed there quite a while at that station, talking to the girl and acting nonchalant. Then I went home and talked to my mother a little, and crabbed about how I had fallen asleep in the movie. I said, how do you like that? You go and pay all that money and then fall asleep? Then I said I'd go back and see it tomorrow night and that gives me an alibi. So I went on in and acted nonchalant. Pretty soon I needed some cigarettes. So I told her in the way the house is laid out, there's a big picture window that's enclosed with curtains and the TV is right over here against the wall. And my mother sits right where that picture window is. All she'd have to do is get up and take a couple steps and open the curtain in order to see if I'm still out there, and she hasn't heard the car leave. But what I didn't realize was that she wouldn't hear that over the TV. So I just went out there, pulled the car around, and opened up the trunk. And this is the way the entire series happened. I took out the big knife, and I cut both of their heads off right out there on the street. It was maybe 10 o'clock at night or possibly 11, but that's where I did that because of the blood problem, because they both had bled very badly in the trunk during the time of running around and sitting at that gas station. It was getting all over everything. Then I went down and got my cigarettes at this little bar down by Seacliff, walked back out, got in the car, drove home, went back in the house, watched TV, and went to bed. The next day, my mother was at work, and it was drizzling. About 10 or 11 in the morning, I started the process. You left them in the trunk all night? Yeah, their clothing was drenched with blood, and there was a tremendous amount of it. Anyway, that next day, I took Miss Lou out of the trunk and into the house. I just carried her right in, right through the back door, because I knew the old biddy in the back there was never out in the rain. So I just wandered on in there and committed this act, which actually was rather difficult. Actually, I think that was the last time I did anything like that. It was rather distasteful. I guess maybe the first time I did something like that, there was a little bit of a charge, you know? Okay. Both girls were in the car all night long with their heads removed, right? Yes. Did you say you took both girls in the house? No, the other girl never left the trunk. Thorpe never left the trunk except for her head, and I took that in the house the next day and removed the bullet. I cleaned the blood off of both of them in the bathroom for disposal later, so I wouldn't get all bloody. Now you took Lou in the house, and then what? At that time, I took the clothes back out and put them in the back seat of the car. Did you immediately attempt to have sexual relations with her? Yes. Did you wash her up or anything beforehand? A little bit with a little rag or something, or a dish towel, or a washcloth or something. But there wasn't much there. She was on top and to the back. Whereabouts in the house did you have this act? In the bedroom. I was very careful, though, about any blood stains or anything like that. Whereabouts in the bedroom? 
I was on the floor. There aren't any blood or blood-related stains on the bed at all. I bleed from little zits and things on me, and there's a stain on the white pad that I think is a baby stain. All right. These sexual acts took place on the floor? Yeah. All right. She still has her hands at this time. Is that correct? Yeah. That was one of the last things I did after she was back in the car. It was an afterthought. Now, she was stripped nude, and you took her clothes out to the car. Was this before or after the sexual act? After. Now, you said you washed her to where it would not look like there was any sexual activity. How did you do this? With I think it was well with a paper towel napkin type thing and some Kleenex type napkins, and there was quite a bit of material there. Her vaginal area was built a little differently than most girls I've seen. It seemed a little bit lower. I don't know what that bone is above the bottom of the pelvis. It is very, very formidable there. It was very definite, and like I said, it was a rather difficult position. Anyway, I more or less poured it out with wet clothes. Then I disposed of them, but I was very careful doing so. Now, these two acts that you had with these girls, did you strip down yourself? I think I did. I changed my clothes while I was at it, too, because I had the clothes from the night before, and they were formidably stained on the pants from the night before, because Miss Lou was quite bloody in the back seat there. When I removed her from the car, I got stains all over the side. Now, we've got Lou in your room. What happened after the sexual acts? Well, like I said, I cleaned her up, I carried her back out, and there was a party going on upstairs. This was about two o'clock in the afternoon. Did you have her wrapped in anything? I think very casually in a blanket or something very small, because her legs were hanging out. I was carrying her like a mannequin, sort of. She was very lightweight. I just wandered right out there with her and put her in the trunk right under the window. That's one thing that amazes me about society, that is, that you can do damn near anything and nobody's going to say anything or notice. All right, then you got her back in the car. Then what happened? That's when I removed the hands. I noticed them especially then. I had a red tub, sort of like a dishwashing plastic dishpan, and I placed the heads and hands in there in the corner in the trunk away from everything else. At this point, Miss Thorpe was mostly clothed. In moving around and stuff, certain things got half pulled off, but mostly she was clothed, but in a state of disarray. But like I remember her bra, she was well built in the chest, and that was still on, but a lot of it was exposed because the shirt was torn open, and the coat was almost pulled off around sideways from trying to move her around in the car there. I removed the boots, that I remember. She didn't have any socks on. This was just before I left, and I took the coat off, and I pulled down her panties, and I noticed that she had a tampon placed, and I removed that, and I just tossed that off. Yes, and I decided to get rid of them up in the Bay Area, because you could tell they'd been from Cabrillo, and I figured these girls were from the university, and as far as the authorities know, the first two could possibly have been killed in Santa Cruz, too, and I wanted to distract the heat away from Santa Cruz. So, figured, so I figured I know both areas, and the authorities wouldn't necessarily know that I know the Bay Area well, because the job that I do entails extensive travel through those areas, especially like with the disposal of Miss Koo's heads and hands. And I knew that particular area really well, and knew that people at 2 o'clock in the morning would not be traveling that road at all. So, they would think that it would be at least somebody within 5 or 10 miles of that area. And that's what I wanted people to think. All right, you drop up 17 to Alameda. Yep, and I stopped by and saw my friend for a while, went out to dinner, and then went out to a movie. I arrived on the scene up at Eden Canyon Road about 2 a.m. In fact, I think it was very close to 2 a.m. when I actually got rid of them. It was probably 1.30 when I got up there, and it was a good half hour or 40 minutes before I had the nerve to get rid of them. I went up and down the road looking for places. I had a big flashlight and was looking all over, vetoing different spots for different reasons. Then I decided upon this one because of the steep grade down from the road and the fact that there were discarded items down there already. And probably nobody would go by looking down there as a habit. 
I dragged both bodies over to the edge and laid them horizontally and pushed and rolled them down. Unfortunately, Miss Lou, both of them, were in rather contorted positions because of their positions in the trunk. Did anything happen while you were disposing of the bodies at that location? No, wait a minute. Yes. When I was pulling Miss Thorpe out of the car, she fell on the back side and left a rather large deposit of excrement. And I'm sure some of it stayed because it was a rather good size of discharge there. Then I just pulled her straight over to the edge. That's the only unusual thing I can think of. There were no cars at all the whole time I was down that road. If even one car had come by while I was down checking things out, I would have vetoed the whole place. Did you deposit all parts of the bodies there? No, like I said, I had the heads and hands in the red container, and at that time, I moved them to the front floorboard on the passenger side and put a blanket over it, so I'd have quick access. I was trying to make up my mind what to do with that, and I decided what I'd do is go up to the Devil's Slide area. My first choice was to go up to Devil's Slide and actually just drive by because it's very dangerous to stop there. So... I decided with these high banks there at Devil's Slide, I'd drive by to find a likely spot and heave them over as hard as I could, hoping they would go in the water. But I vetoed that idea because of all the different chances involved. And, also, because just before I got there, I can't remember the damn name of the town. It's the little town at the base of the hill. The last little hamlet that you're going to hit before you hit Highway 1 and Devil's Slide on down. Pacifica, that's it. I made sure no cars were coming either way when I stopped, checked it out and took off again. Came back around, made sure no cars were coming, pulled up, leaped out, and one head at a time went up to the very top and heaved them as far as I could, and they both landed in the vicinity of that barbed wire fence. And I guess later on, the hair detached itself and the heads rolled on down further. Where did you learn that from? I went back later, about two weeks later. I went back later about two weeks ago. In fact, two weeks to the day, at night worrying, 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 thinking that was a dumb thing to do. Why didn't I skip those heads and bury them somewhere? And I vetoed that originally, because I was just too worked up, and I didn't want to put out any more hassle and take a chance of getting caught. So I went back two weeks later. I had another appointment with my doctor on the cast. So, I went up there about four in the morning and parked and went all over that hillside with that damn flashlight and all I found was the one clump of hair, sort of. It belonged to Miss Thorpe, definitely. It was not scattered. It was sort of in a bundle and was by in a bush or in a bush. That's apparently where it had landed and it had rained a few times. But I guess something like the next day or the day after, those boys up there messing around found one of the skulls. April 25th, 1973. This is an excerpt from Ed Kemper's second confession. Where did you make the removal on this girl's shawl? Uh, It was similar to, in fact, identical to the coup girl, with the exception of the splitting of the torso across the middle, the midsection, and I used an old Division of Highways axe, a large plastic chipping axe that I had. It was rather sharp. Where is it at? It's up at the dump, but I think you can get it. I threw that away after you came up. He caused me quite a bit of consternation, and he was very cool about it, too. The axe is out at the Santa Cruz City dump. You washed this axe? Oh, yeah. It still had some. She was rather fatty, and there was... I had a bad problem there where I didn't with the others, with the body fat. Grease-type coating. And there's some of that still on that axe, I'm sure. Okay, now you have the body in your apartment, all night long, right? Yeah. When did you start dissecting the body? I think it was around 11 o'clock the next morning. It took a hell of a long time. Where was it done at? In the bathtub, there's two bathrooms. The one I used was the one closest to the living room. I removed the sliding glass type plastic doors in the shower and there was an aluminum rail above, and I just removed that whole assembly so it would be like a regular bathtub. And I was very careful and meticulous in cleaning it up. I poured lots of Drano down the thing and made sure it fizzled real good. 
and removed any hair or tissue that got caught in the drain and things like that. Made sure there was no spots of blood laying around. I used that special foam bowl cleaner stuff in any suspicious areas where I thought something like that might be there. Then there's immeasurable baths and showers since then. Anyway, the reason they found that bag or suspected that bag out there on the cliff was because the upper part of the torso was the heaviest and I double lined the bag. I was kind of panicky watching for cars and everything and ran over the edge thinking it was straight down because I had only looked hastily with my flashlight and dumped it out and I forgot about the inside bag and they must have separated down the cliff somewhere. I saw it tumbling. I didn't know if there was water down there or beach or what. I saw a little sliver of beach off to the right and for all I knew it landed right smack dab in the middle of somebody's beach party. So I was very quick about the whole thing and ran. In fact when I dumped the bags with the parts of the arms and legs, one arm I think propped up a little bit out of, I think it was an ice plant. And it was very noticeable, and even back from the guardrail I could see it. I skidded down the side of the hill there, slipping in the mud. I was afraid somebody got footprints off of that. It must have drizzled up there. But this was like 2 o'clock in the morning, and then 3 o'clock that afternoon, that highway patrolman discovered the parts, so I was pretty well blown out after that. I was sure there must be tire prints or one possible tire print or a possible large footprint. All I was worried about was a large footprint because I wear a size 15 shoe and I would tell you a hell of a lot. When you thought you might have left a tire print, did you do anything? No, I thought seriously about getting my tires recapped. Were all parts of the shawl girl deposited at that one spot? Everything but the head. Where's the head? That's what I didn't want to say. It's in the backyard at my mother's place. There's a stone stepping thing in the backyard. What I did was like I, I only cut the hole with a trowel that big around. It was about 11 inches deep. That was on January the 8th. So maybe that was the ninth that I did that. The reason I was going to let it stay there a few months and was going to dig it back up and take the bullet out of the skull and then dispose of the skull rather than hack and chop. Because my thing was no evidence at all if I could possibly help it. If I stand there with that certain type of axe chopping into the skull and dispose of the skull, you're going to have a pretty good idea what type of axe it was. Okay, we've got Cynthia Shaw's shirt and her head over at your house, but all the other parts of her body were deposited over the cliff? Yeah, that was at Sand Creek. I couldn't find the specific spot again, because I'm not familiar with that area. I chose the first steep appearing cliff, and apparently it wasn't steep enough. Also, since then I've disposed of property of Rosalind Thorpe and Alice Liu out in that area. What about the clothing of Shawl? I took that up to Alameda. This on the pretense of telling my mother I was going to visit friends, and very late at night, when nobody was at this all-night laundromat that I used to use. I went in there, and I put the coat in the dryer, and put it on about four dimes worth, and put it on full hot, figuring it would ruin the coat, because it was inexpensive and had a little tear here and there. I figured it would melt certain spots of the plastic, and the owner would come in. He's a little old black guy, and he'd get pissed and throw it in the garbage. I threw the pants in with it, and I think I threw her bra and something else in the trash. The shoes, I think, I'm not sure, but I think I tossed them in the goodwill thing down there. Maybe not. I might have thrown them somewhere. I can't remember, but I know at that time I was very touchy about continuing any patterns, like disposal of clothes, for instance. By that point, investigators might be looking for anything like that showed up. Oh, wait a minute. On the way up on Highway 17, past San Jose, I just heaved it off the side of the road. One of the shoes. And on the next off-ramp, I came back this way and heaved the other one. So that the highway crews wouldn't find them at the same time, and they just figure it fell off a trailer or something. All right. We've to the stuff in the laundromat. Yeah, that was disposed of. I came by the next morning. I didn't even visit my friend. I just parked out in the front of his apartment and slept all night. He was already asleep. I just got up about five or six in the morning, started the car, drove back to the laundromat, 
and he had already taken the trash out. The coat and everything was gone, so there was no sweat. There was no struggle out of Shaul? Absolutely nothing. There was no hanky-panky, no assault, or anything like that. Was there anything out of the ordinary you haven't told us about this particular girl? Yeah, she had a joint of pot in her pocket. That I got rid of very quickly. All I needed to do was get busted for dope. I don't like that stuff anyway. But she had that in her coat pocket. What do you mean as far as unusual? What I'm making reference to is the time that she was shot, or after she was shot. Had she been tied or gagged? No, not at all. I imagine you have some very deep marks on her wrists, appearing to be handcuffs, and that's how I moved her around, you know, with a broken arm, not being able to pick her up. Then I reached in the front from the back between the body and the arms and dragged her that way. That was after she was dead. I didn't put anything on. She was very, very touchy about that. It was hard enough just getting her to get in the trunk, and as soon as she got in, that's when I shot her. And you put the handcuffs on after that? Yeah, after she was shot, two times. Once in the morning in the house, and once in the bedroom and the bathroom. When you took her into the house, sometime after 8.45, the time you fixed the shooting, did you leave with her? I think it was about 10 o'clock when I took her in. I just left her outside because I thought possibly my mother would come home. So I just left her in the car for a while. Did you leave her in the closet all night long? What did you do with her all night? She stayed right in there till about maybe 30 or 40 minutes after. I got her in the house. It was very hard getting her in the closet because I couldn't pick her up and place her anywhere. It seemed to me almost immediately after that but I knew if I tried any messing around, or anything which I believe would have been very difficult anyway, she was a rather large girl, but I did disrobe her before I put her in the closet. I took her clothes off and hid them under my bed. Then, I put them in my car the next day, and got rid of them. You put her in the closet in the nude then? You didn't put her on your bed? Yeah, I don't know if you'd know what the layout of my bedroom is, I've got a narrow angle bed that a... Did you try and have sexual relations with her? I did. You did have sexual relations with her? Yeah, on the 4th, the next morning. This sounds terrible, but that night, she was quite limp and very hard to move around as it was. And I just... No way that, um... But I'd never had sex with a large girl like that before. And I decided to see what it was like. Actually, you can't really check that point off, I understand, because of the state of the body. But I will say that the next morning I did. Also, that pretty much finishes that one because that brings up something about the next two. I did have relations with Alice Liu after her death. Also, I imagine the heavy rains up in the area after I disposed of their bodies helped. What type of knife did you use to dissect her? I use the same knife in all of them. It's, it's a buck knife. It's called the General, and it's the largest. It's something like a Bowie knife, but it has more of a straight blade, rather than real fancy or curved. Where is it at now? It's at home. It has a black case. I think it's... There's two pink chest drawers, one right beside the door, and there's one over by the closet, and it's the one right inside the door. That's where I kept my guns and pistols, ammunition, and the knife. Is this knife sharp, or did you sharpen it? It still had the factory sharpened. It's an extremely hard-tempered steel. In fact, I had a hard and a soft sharpening stone for it, and they wouldn't even touch it. I had to get a carbide steel rod to sharpen it with, and then use the others to finish it off. So, actually, it was a semi-sharp knife, but it had an extremely fine edge to it, but I had to use quite a bit of effort. Like where I had just bought the knife, and I used it on Aiko Ku, it was no problem at all. It was extremely sharp and brand new. I had bought it maybe that day or the day before, something like that. Is this a different knife than you used on the first two girls? Yeah. I used the pocket knife on them because all I removed was heads, and it was extremely sharp, too. Okay, let's go over to... The last two, that was the 5th of February, 
and I'm not really sharp on the time. You say this was about 8.30, when you picked up the girls. I picked up Miss Thorpe first, and I guess it was up around Merrill College, up towards the top, and I had passed her, actually. I think the time was around uh, 8 or 8.30. I didn't watch the time too closely. But apparently this seminar was about in the middle, and she had either decided she didn't like it or she had a class. I can't remember. But I had just passed her, and as I was passing her, I said, well, she's not bad looking. So I stopped, and she hesitated. She was probably about 20 yards behind the car, and looked to the rear, and she saw the wrecked up car there, and hesitated for a moment. Then, I'm sure she saw the A tag, and ran right along and hopped in. I told her, she asked me where I was going, and that had always been a problem with me, because when they ask me where I'm going, and I say the wrong thing, they won't get in. If I say I'm going, say, down to Mission, and they say they're going up the other end of Mission, or something like this, sometimes it's an excuse to not get in. Sometimes they're actually going the other way, and I'll blow an awful good opportunity, because I didn't think quick enough. Could you describe her to us? Yeah, she was 5'6", I think, and probably close to the weight of the shawl girl, about 150 pounds, something like that. She was very hard to handle because I had still had problems with my arm. It was still in a cast. You picked up, you think, Thorpe, sometime around 8.30 up at Merrill College? Yeah, out on the road. That was Sunday, out on the other side of the road. All right, let's go into Thorpe here. You had her in the car. What was your next move? I started talking with her. Basically, she carried the conversation. She was very outgoing, and I was just trying to be amicable. And I was trying to think, do what I was going to do. I had decided after we had rode a little ways that that was it. I was going to get her, definitely. I had my little zapple through my body there, and that always confirmed it. I never had one of those where it didn't actually happen. It's just where everything would click just right. Circumstances were perfect. Nobody else was around. The guard didn't notice me coming in. Nothing that looked unusual going out. And she was not the least bit suspecting. Also, it was somebody that I didn't know in any way, shape, or form. Or knew anybody that I knew about. So those were certain things I held as absolute. One I had held as an absolute for a long time was don't ever do anything like that around the Santa Cruz area because that's too close to home. And having the past I had, I would naturally come under suspicion. But then I started getting sicker and sicker later on and a little more and more careless in my approach to in taking care of things. And afterwards, which I'm sure got obvious, because more and more evidence started popping up in different forms. Well, let's go on to the sequence of what happened. Okay, what happened next is we were talking, and she is more or less popping little questions here and there, talking along. I noticed Miss Lou standing on the side, threw out a great big beautiful smile and stuck her thumb out very hopefully, and, you know, not a cheesecake type thing, but, you know, throwing her best foot forward there... From some of her ID, college friends, stable background and all that, I imagine she was a cautious hitchhiker, and she always made sure of her ride before she got in. And we appeared to be a couple, and with that A tag on there, and a man and a woman, you know? So she didn't hesitate at all about getting in. Did the girls appear to know one another? No, not at all. Was she carrying anything? Yes, a purple book bag with white Chinese lettering on the front and a strap over the shoulder and several papers inside. She had a wallet, lots of IDs, and pictures and things like that. What struck me about Miss Thorpe was that she didn't have any money at all, not even change in her purse. She had just gotten a letter from home with a check in it. Where's the check? At the bottom of the ocean. I left everything in both bags, kept them for quite a while sweating the whole time, wondering if somebody was going to come out there and investigate me, or if my mother's going to go through my closet and stumble across it and immediately know what it was without even opening it. So, I went out past that rocky creek point, farther out to Big Sur, well, not Big Sur, but out where the road curves ahead and starts to go down the coast, to one of the cliffs out there, and threw both bags out as far as I could. 
about how much time span between the time you did it with these girls and threw out the bags? Well, that was the 5th of February, and I did the thing with the bags in late April. Getting rid of the bags was at least a month or maybe five weeks after. What happened when you had both girls in the car now? I passed the guard and made sure he didn't take special notice of us. I was sure he only noticed the girl in the front. Both of us were in a stabilized mood, sort of, chatting as we went out. Miss Lou was quiet in the back, sitting in the back right behind Miss Thorpe. We started down around the first curve there. We went down a ways to where it straightens out, and you can see the city and the lights. And I slowed down and remarked about the beautiful view, and I asked if she minded if I slowed down, and she said, not at all. She was watching, and I looked back at Miss Lou and asked her the same question, and she said, no. But I got the impression from her she was just saying no because she was getting a ride and didn't mind slowing down a little bit, and was disgusted for maybe five or six seconds, which were long because I knew there were no cars coming at that moment, and I didn't see any coming up, and I hesitated for several seconds because I was very scared, really. I had never done something like that before, where I'd just come out and shoot somebody, just right out of the blue. But I was mad that night. My mother and I had a real tiff. I was pissed. I told her I was going to a movie, and I jumped up and went straight to the campus because it was still early. I said, the first girl that's halfway decent that I pick up, I'm going to blow her brains out. As it was, I improvised. It was two in a perfect situation. That's the only reason there were two that night, just because they happened to be there. Miss Thorpe almost didn't get picked up, you know. Because I almost passed her on by, and if I hadn't picked her up, Miss Lou wouldn't have got it, with a single guy. A young guy. I don't think she would have gotten in. Anyway, we slowed down there, almost to a stop. We're just barely moving, and I have been moving my pistol from down below my leg in my lap. A solid black pistol. And the interior of my car was black, so she couldn't see it. And I picked it up and had it on my lap talking with her, and I moved it up to the side like this, and I just picked it up and pulled the trigger, because I knew the minute I picked it up like that, the girl in the back was going to see it, and I didn't want any problems. So, as soon as I picked it up, I hesitated maybe for a second at the very most, and then pulled the trigger. This is on the straight stretch, coming down from the campus, overlooking the city? Right. That would be on the eastern side of the farthest eastern part of the campus. It's the only major straightaway there. It was halfway between the bottom of the hill and the kiosk, so I was confident there wouldn't be any noise heard. I had a blanket in the back, folded up, right in the back seat, and I had a large coat sitting there, too. A green coat. There's some evidence for you. There's a small blood stain on that green coat for you, inside the lining. Was your car still moving when you shot her? Very slowly, yeah. Just barely moving. Just like maybe one-fourth of a mile an hour. Almost to a stop. Like I didn't want the brake lights on in case somebody was around the corner, because that would be something to stick in their memory. What did Lou do at that particular time? Well, as I lifted the gun up, I heard a slight gasp in the back, and I think possibly Miss Thorpe heard it, because she started to turn her head as I pulled the trigger. She instantly just fell over against the window. Do you recall what portion of the head or body that the bullet went into? Right square in the middle of the left side of her head. It was just above the ear, maybe an inch. But basically, I was sizing up, looking at her head. She had a rather large forehead, and I was imagining what her brain looked like inside. And I just wanted to put it right in the middle of that. So, it was above and a little behind the ear, or not actually above and behind the ear. I was centering on the temple, not aiming at it, but so it would be a little bit back and above the temple. So it would be towards the front portion of the top of the ear, just above the hairline. Did that bullet remain in the skull? No, it did not exit, though, because she was right by the window. It was one of the first things I checked. What happened was, I fired, and Miss Lou panicked, and started covering her face up. And that's why I cut her hands off, because she had four bullet holes in her hands. Two in each hand. I had to fire through the hands. She was moving very quickly around, and she was down into the corner, and I missed twice. 
One just went through her hand, I guess. It went right into the padding of the car. The next shot I fired went into one of her hands, the back of her hand, and hit her just right around the temple area on the right side of her head and it had a glancing blow, cause it took a long tearing cut in and went right along the bone. I'm sure it broke the top of the jawbone, cause there were broken bones up in that area. It creased along there, came out, exited through the ear. There was a hole in the ear and hit the same padded area as the first bullet. It hit at a glancing angle and it was flattened out. The bullet was, it hit in and ricocheted off of the inside, came back out, right in front of the cushion, hit the cushion, it bounced out into the front floor mat, and I found it there. That, I think, stunned her. She was making quite a bit of noise. No loud shrieks or screams, but quite a bit of fuss there. And then as I fired a second time, it quieted down, but she was still making noise, and her hands were starting to come down, and she was moving over a little bit, and I thought she was still going, so I aimed carefully and fired. That was the bullet that would be in this area on the right front forehead, just about the middle of the forehead, and that was the last shot I fired at them. But there was one more fired later. April 28, 1973. This is an extract from Ed Kemper's third confession. This interview will be based around the incidents that occurred at your home last Saturday. Is there anything that you want to tell me that led up to this incident? Not really. Well, let's start with the reason for it. That's rather involved. The reason for it is these murders were coming to a head. I felt that I was going to be caught pretty soon for the killing of these girls, or I was going to blow up and do something very open and get myself caught. And so I did not want my mother... A long time ago I had thought about what I was going to do in the event of being caught for the crimes and the only choices I seen open is being that I could just accept it and go to jail and let my mother carry the load and let the whole thing fall in her hands like what happened last time with my grandparents. Or I could take her life. Well, I guess that leaves me two choices. I could either do it in the open with her knowing what was happening or I could do it when she didn't know what was happening. Last Friday night, whatever date that was, I had decided it was the night before the killing, or the day before the killing, really. I had been thinking about it for quite a while, and I just started working myself up towards the act of killing her. I guess that answers the reason. All right, you want to get into the actual crime? Okay, I got home Friday night, or I got back to her home from Alameda, where I'd been working early Friday in the afternoon, and I sat around the house and took care of a few business problems. You know, calling and making a couple of phone calls that were unrelated to the problem. And I called my mother at work and let her know I was in town, and she told me that she was going out to a dinner, some faculty dinner or something. And she'd be home late. So I sat around and drank some beer, watched television, stayed up as late as I could, and I had wished to talk to her, really, before anything had happened. It was my hope that she would go on good terms, and that was impossible because, well, I guess it would be good terms because we hadn't really argued or anything when we talked on the phone. I went to bed about midnight, I guess, and I woke up a couple of hours later. Well, let me see, that doesn't work out right. I think I went to bed around 2, and she still wasn't home, and I went to bed and went to sleep. I woke up a couple of hours later, around 4, and she had already come home, done whatever she does when she gets home late at night, and had retired for the evening. This was after I'd gone to bed around 2 a.m., Saturday morning. She was in bed reading a book, and I woke up around 4 o'clock in the morning, two hours after I went to sleep, roughly. The lights were pretty much out in the house. I didn't see any lights on. I hadn't heard anything, and I thought, gee, it's 4 o'clock and she's still not home. So, I got up, and I walked out of my bedroom, noticed her small light was on, and walked into her bedroom, just as she had taken off her glasses, and turned the light off. Without her turning it back on, she commented that, uh, I said, oh, you're home. She says, you're up. What are you doing up? I said, well, I just wanted to see if you were home. I hadn't heard anything. She said, oh, I suppose you want to talk. 
This has happened several times before, when she'd come in late and I wanted to talk, and we'd talk, and then she'd go to sleep. She didn't say it in an abusive manner. It was more or less just jive. And I said, no. She said, well, we'll talk in the morning. I said, fine, good night. She left the light out, and I walked out of the room and back to my bedroom, laid down, and decided at that point I was going to wait another hour or so, until she was asleep before it happened. I looked at my watch. It was about a quarter after four, something like that, and I laid there in the bed thinking about it, and it's something hard to just up and do. It was the most insane of reasons for going and killing your mother. But I was pretty fixed on that issue because there were a lot of things involved. Someone just standing off on the side, watching something like that, isn't really going to see any kind of sense or rhyme or reason to anything. I had done some things and I felt that I had to carry the full weight of everything that happened. I certainly wanted for my mother a nice, quiet, easy death, like I guess everyone wants. The only thing I saw this possible was for it to be in bed while she was asleep. The next thing was to decide how to do it. The only possible answer to that I saw was to take a hammer and hit her with it in her sleep, and then to cut her throat. So I waited till about 5.15 a.m. I went into the kitchen and got a hammer. We have a regular claw hammer at home. Picked up my pocket knife, the same one I'd used to kill Marianne Peace with, opened it up, and I carried that in my right hand and the hammer in my left, walked into her bedroom very quietly. She had been sound asleep. She moved around a little bit and I thought maybe she was waking up. I just waited and waited and she was just lying there. So I approached her right side to my right on the right side of the bed on her side. I stood there for a couple of minutes and spent most of that day and most of that week I suppose and most of that night trying to get myself, I guess you'd say, hopped up to do something like that thinking nothing but reasons to do it, and the need to do it, trying to keep everything else out of my mind. I stood by her side for a couple of minutes, I suppose, and about 5.15, I struck, and I hit her just about the temple on the right side of her head, the side of her head, the side that was up from the pillow. It was above and behind her temple, on the right side of her head. I struck with a very hard blow, and I believe I dropped the hammer, or I laid it down, or something. Immediately, blood started running down her face from the wound, and she was still breathing. I could hear the breathing, and I heard blood running into her. I guess it was her windpipe. It was obvious I'd done severe damage to her, because in other cases where I'd shot people in the head, I heard the same, or it had the same effect. Blood running into the breathing passages, and this all happened in a few moments. But after I struck, I moved wherever in the bed on her back and with my right hand holding her chin up, I slashed her throat. She bled profusely all over, and I guess it was an afterthought. I hadn't really thought of it, but her being my mother and me doing those other things, and I knew right now I had torn everything out in the open, and my plan, which I didn't mention earlier, had been to just... Well, everything's getting to an end, and I could either kill her and turn myself in, or I could kill her and head out with everything I had. My arsenal, this was my choice at the time. So I decided at that time, it's a hell of a cliche to use, but I guess what was good for my victims was good for my mother. So, after I slashed her throat, I went ahead and slashed the rest of the way around her neck and took off her head, and I guess half as much of that was to make absolutely sure in my own mind that she was dead instantly and right then. So the whole attack took maybe less than half a minute, possibly even as little as 20 seconds. Then after this, I moved her out of the bed and her nightgown was very bloody and I didn't want to make a big mess in the house because if I did and someone in our family or a friend came by, it would be obviously noticeable and it would give away what I was doing before I wanted it to be. So I pulled off her nightgown, tore it off, and then pulled her body and put handcuffs on her wrists because it was very hard to move her and pulled her into her closet into the very far back and put her sideways in the closet in the back took all the bloody bedding off of her bed put that in on top of her and flipped the mattress over because it was very bloody 
changed the bedding on it, and arranged the clothes in the closet to cover her up, and I cleaned off the blood where it hit the wall. It hadn't gone on very high on the wall, at the most, maybe ten inches above the bed level. There was quite a bit of blood running down the wall, and into the carpet. I cleaned off the blood down below the top of the bed level, and by this time, well, several little things happened in between. A lot of running around the house that seems inconsequential at this point. But anyway, it was well after dawn. In fact, dawn was breaking while this happened. It was barely visible in the light, but this was well into the morning by now when all this was accomplished. The house looked back to normal, and sometime early in the morning, I got in my car and went down and drove. I had become quite ill immediately after it happened, and hadn't eaten anything the night before. But I had the dry heaves quite a few minutes after it happened. I was unable to do anything. Then when I was, I did these things I mentioned. Finally, I went out. I couldn't stand being around the house anymore, so I put a couple of guns in my car. Well, I think I put them all in my car, but this was real early. I started driving around town. I was looking for a hardware store and a saw, possibly a hacksaw blade. Not having any sidearms, I'd hoped to take the carbine that I had and cut the stock down to the pistol grip and possibly cut down the barrel to the forestock, making it a semi-pistol automatic weapon. There were a few other things I'd wanted to buy. I realized that my mother not being there Easter weekend would be highly suspicious by the family and friends, and a cause for alarm, and I realized that her not appearing at work Monday would be alarm enough without having people pre-alarmed on Easter weekend. So, I decided that someone else had to die too, a friend of hers, as a cover-up. An excuse, something that would be believable by other people involved and other friends and possibly family that might get in touch and call. So I started thinking about who would be a victim, who would be most available, who would be the easiest to kill, and who would be likely to be gone with my mother for the weekend. So I fell upon a friend of hers, Sarah Hallett, or Sally Hallett, who had frequently gone places with my mother and done things on weekends. Mrs. Hallett called on the phone around 5.30 and wanted to speak to my mother. And before telling her she wasn't home, I asked her what she was doing that night. She said, why? I told her I'd just gone back to work and had gotten a raise while I was home recuperating for four and a half months with my broken arm. This previous week had been my first week back at work on a regular job in Oakland. And I told her that I was celebrating and that I'd like her to come along with my mother and I to dinner and a movie. The reason I did this was I knew she'd accept. I don't know if I should say for selfish purposes she would accept, but I had surmised from past acquaintances with her and past sessions, let's say at home and out, that she would leap at something like that. So that's what I thought to say. Of course, she jumped at the idea. I told her that my mother was not home, that she would be home a little later, and I said, why don't you come over about 7.30 and we'll supervise her and go out to dinner and a movie. She said, fine. I prepared for her coming. I closed all the windows and the doors in the house, making sure all the sliding windows were shut and all the doors to the various rooms to the house were shut, leaving the living room very quiet, which was where I planned on killing her. Next, I had to decide how to do it. I felt upon the idea of strangulation. So, I had a cord that I had taken from the first two girls that I had killed, Miss Peace and Miss Lucessa. It was a strong nylon rope type cord, and it was probably three feet in length, maybe a little longer. I took that into the living room. I took in a large bludgeon type broken piece of equipment that I had had from the state. It was a top end of a drill shank, which is approximately one five eighths of an inch diameter and was close to a foot long, I'd say, about 10 inches or 11 inches long. I was backing myself up in case of possible difficulties in my attack. I also placed my carbine in the next room against a wall, just in case again I figured one shot was better than a lot of screaming in case something went wrong where she was lucky and possibly incapacitated me partially. The neighbors were quiet, very quiet in the neighborhood. Some were not home and others didn't have lights on and were entertaining or some such. 
So, at any rate, by 7.30 she hadn't arrived. I waited and waited, and just before, maybe six minutes to eight, she did arrive, went into the house. I met her at the door. We spoke, and she came inside. I removed her wrap, which was a sweater. We talked about where my mother was, and I said I was sure she was coming soon, that she had just called from a friend's house, which was something that was very common around there. So she accepted it fully. We moved across the living room towards the couch. It was an oblong living room, rectangular shaped, and some of the preparations I had also... I hate to break off at this point, but some of the preparations I had made, I had used some 3-inch wide medical tape that I had used in the Aiko coup killing. I had just pulled off a long piece of that and stuck it partially into the wall in the kitchen, right around the corner from the living room, and also I had brought two clear plastic bags that I had bought from a laundry for use in these killings, the co-ed killings, and for my car. I placed them in a readily available area, and also my handcuffs that I had used in some of the killings I put into my pocket. So then, anyway, she came, and we talked, and we were crossing the living room towards the couch. I was balking at what I had to do, or what I felt I had to do, and that was the last thing I wanted to do. I didn't want to seem obvious at anything being wrong. I was stalling around as we moved across the room. My first intention was to strike her in the midsection and around the solar plexus and knock the wind from her so that she couldn't cry out and then strangle her. It was this first move that I was kind of dreading. I guess what really worked me into it really was that she saw that as a cue and I struck her in the stomach and she fell back or jumped back mostly, I guess. I was quite surprised at her reaction. I hit her hard in the midsection and she jumped back and said, Guy, stop that. I struck her again immediately after the first blow, and her last words were, Oh, and sort of stumbled back. I pulled her around toward me, facing away from me, threw my left arm around her neck. It was hurting at that point, but I didn't realize it then because I was so wrapped up in what I was doing. It's almost like blacking out. You know what you're doing, but you don't notice anything else around. But in striking her, I had held my thumbs wrong when I made a fist, and I had jammed my thumb and hurt my wrist. It's weak anyway, being in a cast so long. But I grabbed her around the neck with the left wrist at her throat, put her into a chokehold, annulled her off the floor, in fact, where she was dangling across my chest, and there were absolutely no sounds coming from her at the time. She was holding my arm with both of her hands, trying to pull away, apparently. There was no real tugging, just holding onto my arm. Her legs weren't really kicking at all. She was moving around a little bit, but very little. But no sound at all came from her, and at that time, I thought that she was so embarrassed or so shocked at what had just happened that she really couldn't say anything and that she was waiting for me to make a move. I didn't really think that I had cut her wind off so completely that not even a little squeak or any gasp or anything had come out. So I pulled her back farther and looked down into her face, and her eyes were bulging badly. Her face was turning black at that point, and this was just moments after I had grabbed her. Her face was turning from a bright red to a black, and I realized that I was actually cutting her wind off completely, and later on, I realized I crushed her larynx, or at least dislocated it to where she couldn't breathe, and I guess I had completely cut the wind off. When she went limp completely, I dropped her to the floor and tied the bags around her head with a cord after I had put the tape over her mouth, which really didn't work. So I had just pulled that off. When she completely quit struggling, there were some automatic reflexes in the lung area. Her chest was heaving once in a while. When that all stopped, I put her on my bed in my bedroom, threw all of her belongings, other than her purse, in my clothes hamper, covered her up with a blanket, went into the other room with her belongings, and removed the money from her wallet. I don't really remember how much was in there. It was a slight amount of money. I left the house, I got in her car, went down to the jury room in Santa Cruz, a bar, and drank for an hour or so, went back to the house. Maybe it was a couple of hours, I don't know. But from the time I attacked her until I came back to the house was, I think, three hours. When I came back, she apparently had been set upon by rigor mortis already, 
and that's why I stretched her out on the bed. I removed her from my bed and noticed that when I picked her up, that her neck was broken also, because everything else was stiff, and having dealt with dead bodies before, everything gets stiff, and the neck and facial area went first, along with the extremities. When I moved her head, I noticed that the neck was completely broke, completely dislocated from the spinal column. I moved her from the bed into the closet, or... wait a minute, now, that was the next morning. I left her on that bed, and I slept in my mother's bed. The next morning, I didn't get very much sleep that night, maybe six hours. I got up early the next morning. That's when I moved Mrs. Hallett's body up to the closet, into the stand-up wooden closet in my mother's room, and closed the door, and put the desk in front of that door, so nobody would open it, and it would be just like it had been before. If someone opened the other door of the closet, it was so packed with things that one would not see anything on the other side. Thus, with a body in each closet, I prepared to leave. I got my things together, and at about 9.45 a.m., I left Santa Cruz in Miss Hallett's car. I had transferred the guns from my trunk to her trunk, and I believe that was that. Also, during the crime, I had kept pulling this cord very tightly around her neck before she was actually dead, leaving a very deep gouge around her neck from that cord, where I had placed my foot on her neck and pulled very tightly as a noose-type fashion around that cord, trying to get it tight around those bags, and it wasn't working. Maybe the bag was torn, I don't know, but some air was still coming inland out of the bag. So, I went to the bedroom and took a knitted muffler, white wool muffler that I had taken from one of the co-ed victims, Miss Aiko Ku, and wrapped this tightly around her neck in a single knot and just pulled it tight, and this seemed to do the trick. And that's when I moved her into the bedroom and later on removed the cord from her neck. Did you ever handcuff Mrs. Hallett? Yes. Yes, I did come to think of it. Yeah, when she was unconscious and on the floor from being in that stranglehold from the rear, I put her down on the floor, pulled the handcuffs out of my pocket, and put them on her with her hands behind her back, and that's when I proceeded to cover her mouth with tape and placed the bags over her head. It was symbolic, I suppose. I believed between the two that the authorities would immediately surmise that I was the person they were looking for in the other slayings. Partly the head, I told you that was also to make sure for myself that she was dead, even though I knew with a cut throat that she was, but I did it so quick, I wanted to make absolutely sure there wasn't any suffering. But the hand, I think, it's like that left hand of God thing. I had always considered my mother very formidable, very fierce, and very foreboding. She had always been a very big influence on my life, and whether I hated her or loved her, it was very dynamic. And the night she died, or the morning, it was amazing to me how much like every other victim of mine had died, how vulnerable and how human she was. It shocked me for quite some time. I'm not sure that it still doesn't shock me. I feel quite relieved after her death. A lot of it was guilt that I had been building up, and fear that she would find out about what had happened and what it would do to her. I was glad that it had been quick. I got Officer Andy Crane on the phone, whom I knew from previous times in Santa Cruz. I told him that I wanted to talk to Lieutenant Scherer, and he said he's not in, and I said, I know that. I said, I'm the one he's looking for. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you want to know what I'm saying? I said, do you want to know about those co-eds? He said, what's your name? I said, don't worry about a name. I just want to talk to Lieutenant Scherer and get him down there as quick as you can. I'll call back. He said, well, I have to have a name. I said, okay, Andy. And I could feel him stiffen over the phone. And I said, this is Ed Kemper. And I don't know at that point whether he thought I was drunk and kidding around or dead serious. I told him it was very serious and that something was going to happen soon if I didn't get him on the phone. He told me he'd try to get in touch with him. I hung up and called back 45 minutes later, as I said I would. Mr. Crane had gone home. It was change of shift, and the new man on was vaguely aware of what was going on. 
I didn't have the change at that time to call back, so I called Collect. He refused the call and indicated that Lieutenant Scherer wouldn't be in until 9 a.m. This threw me so far back and realizing at that time that they were not at all aware of what had happened with my mother and her friend and with the state I was in, this was a hell of a shock to me and that's when I started going off the deep end. I just had to screw all those people in Santa Cruz and get the nearest cop I could find. I raced on to, into Pueblo. I think it was West Pueblo, got very confused, driving down the wrong way on streets and off ramps and everything else, and turning around, and finally found a phone booth and called up Santa Cruz again, being told that Lieutenant Scherer was not there and would not be in until, this was maybe 5.30, telling the officer that I had a lot of guns in the car, a lot of bullets, that I had killed a lot of people, and that if I didn't get somebody over there quick, it was going to happen again. I wouldn't have any control over it this time. About this time, a car pulled up and an officer jumped out and arrested me, took me into custody. Two more officers came and they took me back to the Pueblo Police Department. And I guess from there is a matter of record. Okay, I have a series of questions that I'd like to ask you, pertaining to some of the details, also pertaining to how you might have felt or some other things that you might have done that you don't recollect. Let's start with this most recent incident involving your mother and Mrs. Hallett. Did you at either time sexually assault either one of them? I believe there was an attempt, but there wasn't any ejaculation with Mrs. Hallett. I believe I probably penetrated her. At what point was this? I don't remember. It would have to have been the night before I left, sometime after I killed her. This was after she was dead? Yes. How about your mother? No, my mother was stripped. I suppose that would have been a possibility that would come into somebody's mind. But, well, my mother was moved around quite a bit, and I did strip her clothes off. Also, if you will remember on our trip back from Pueblo, you mentioned the fact that you had written a note and left it in the apartment. Yeah, I was feeling kind of salty at that point, and I had been rather efficient in covering up evidence in other cases. There was quite a bit of blood under the bed against the wall, and that really not seeing any need to cover anything other than superficial doctoring of the evidence. I wrote a note to the people involved that, and I'm not sure, but I think the time that Mrs. Hallett died and apologizing for the mess and saying that I'm not really that sloppy, but there wasn't any time to be any neater or something along that line. Do you remember when you left the note? Or rather, where you left the note? Yeah, behind the bed after I pushed it to the wall right next to the blood stains on the rug. Do you feel that you've got urges to kill people? Or is it just something kind of spontaneous? Well, it's kind of hard to go around killing somebody just for the hell of it. It's not a kicks thing, or I would have ceased doing it a long time ago. It was an urge. I wouldn't say it was on the full of the moon or anything, but I noticed that no matter how horrendous the crime had been, or how vicious the treatment of the bodies after death or, say, on the previous killing, let's use that as an example, the shawl girl, which was a particularly distasteful method of disposing of a body. It was very distasteful in the dissection of her body, and it was very painful to me physically with a broken arm and doing this thing, and it was rather hard on my body physiologically going through that stress. Still, at that point in my crimes, the urge to do it again was coming as often as a week or two weeks afterwards. A strong urge, and the longer I let it go, the stronger it got, to where I was taking risks to go out and kill people. Risks that normally, according to my little rules of operation, I wouldn't take because they could lead to arrest. Did you ever make any plans out of any ideas of killing somebody that you know? Oh, I did have fantasies about that. But one of my rules of operation was that I not do something like that unless it was at that last moment and everything was up in the air and there was no chance of keeping it quiet, as in the case of my mother and Mrs. Hallett. After that, the door was wide open, with the exception of not killing someone that would bring the attention to me any sooner than I wanted, and I had wanted a couple of days' head start. You mentioned to me at one time that you had a fantasy of killing everybody on your block. In Aptos. Yeah, that was one of my things when I'd feel inadequate there, feel like everybody's catching up with me and I'm not doing anything. I thought, 
and without, I don't think, too much hallucination considering the abilities I did have in, say, creating a calm about me where people weren't excited or suspicious or nervous and had the trust of most of the people around, I believed and still believe that had I wanted to, just as a demonstration, and I thought of making this as a demonstration to the authorities in Santa Cruz, how serious this was and how bad a foe they had come up against, or how difficult a one, or how crafty or whatever, I had thought of annihilating the entire block that I lived on, or had lived on in Aptos, which would include several homes, not only the block that I lived on, but the houses opposing it, which could have included as many as 10 or 12 families, or members of those families, that would be there when I'd make my attack, and it would be a very subtle, very slow, quiet attack, where no one would be aware of what was going on in the surrounding area. And this would have happened very quickly. Of course, I wouldn't have been involved as I was in the other killings. I would have done it and left, I think, very unnoticeably by the other people that would still be there. All right, and you mentioned your rules of operation. Could you tell me basically what those are? Yes, these were observances that I had made before I actually gone into operation. Let's say on the crimes against the co-eds. For a long time, I just drove around, originally with the purpose of just getting to know more people and seeing where people's heads were at, not trying to make a pun that were my own age or younger, because I had quite a gap of existence there and quite a gap of awareness of my having been to Atascadero and going through quite a few different programs where my awareness of myself and my surroundings I do believe I was a little bit more acute than the people I had to live with and deal with out on the streets. This is a problem we approached in the hospital and solved theoretically, but it was very difficult on the streets to gain an honest rapport with other people who weren't aware of the special problems of an ex-mental patient who didn't want to be known as an ex-mental patient. I drove around picking up several people and noticing the different situations, like that girls were hitchhiking alone and in pairs, and quite naively and quite innocently, and people around weren't paying any attention. And I could pick up as many people as I wanted, as often as I wanted, without authorities really becoming aware of it. They were about their own duties. Some of them, I suppose, including watching rather than think of a rape type thing where threatening the people not to turn you in. I'd been through all that at Atascadero and watched hundreds and hundreds of rapists go through and always being caught eventually. So I decided to kind of nix the two and have a situation of rape and a murder and no witness and no prosecution. My first rule for operation was to be observant of everything around me far before the approach. If I knew I was going to commit a crime on a certain day, I watched very carefully the situation, the flow of traffic, how heavy the police traffic was, how observant they were being of me in particular and the people around me, the mood of the hitchhikers, which pretty much was according to what day it was. On weekends, everybody was hitchhiking and nobody was paying any attention. Sometimes there were police, and sometimes there weren't. So, rule number one was watch the traffic and try not to pick anybody up when it's too light or when there are too many people out on foot around the area. These weren't fantastically specific rules. It was more general things. That was one. Don't do it if there are police around. Don't pick anybody up when police are around. Or if you do, make sure it's very obvious that you're letting them out not getting in when police are around. From then on, I did not pick people up for sport anymore. It was for possible execution. I didn't pick up males anymore. It was all co-eds, and it would only be if they were a possible candidate for death, which would mean that they were young, reasonably good-looking, not necessarily well-to-do, but say of a better class of people than the scroungy, messy, dirty, smelly, hippie-type girls I wasn't interested in at all. I suppose they would have been more convenient, but that wasn't my purpose. My little social statement was I was trying to hurt society where it hurt the worst, and that was by taking its valuable members, 
or future members of the working society. That was the upper class or the upper middle class. What I considered to be snobby or snotty brat or person that was actually then ended up later being better equipped to handle a living situation than I was and have more happily adjusted. I consider it a very phony society, a very phony world where people were so busy coping out to so many things to exist and fit into a group that they had lost sight of their individual aims and goals. I had become completely lost and very bitter about what I consider these phony values and phony existences, and decided I was going not necessarily to weed things out, because I would have ended up killing most of the world if I weeded out. But I was striking out at what was hurting me the worst, which was the area, I guess down deep, I wanted to fit in the most, and I had never fit in. And that was the group, the in-group, like I said about these rules, one was before the ones I've mentioned. I would not circle back if I saw a good prospect. I would not circle back to pick her up unless it was really hurt on a limb and I hadn't run into anybody all week. There was a couple of exceptions to that rule, like their first killings. I had turned around a couple of blocks up, but I realized then I was really sticking my neck out and being obvious to several people. I was quite lucky nobody noticed or had it stick in their mind but I did turn around and go back and pick up those girls. Besides, they could notice me doing it, and if they did refuse the ride, there would be a possible witness to a future crime for the police to work on, realizing they couldn't come grab me. They could start watching me, and I wouldn't necessarily know it. So, to be inconspicuous as possible was the order of the day. I had no wild things on my car, no wild clothes, no flashy driving. It was all strictly down the line, very casual, very relaxed, smiling. Only when I had approached the girls, because to sit around smiling a lot in a car would draw a notice every now and then. I wanted to be absolutely nondescript. Being 6'9", it's difficult. But sitting in the car with lots of leg room, I was able to scrunch down enough to where not even the passengers in the car would realize how tall I was. Other rules were that I would take no chances that I didn't absolutely have to take, which meant mostly condescending or ascending to the wishes of the victims before their deaths, which would always be to their benefit. Their requests and their pleas would be to their benefit, and not to my own, no matter how good it sounded. So I had predetermined what exactly I was going to do, or not exactly, but down to a fairly fine point, to where I could leave a little bit of leeway open to random chance, meaning that I would pretty well have a plan or route of travel set up after the pickup, and I would pick at certain points, unless just by random chance, someone was in the middle of the block or in a wrong area. I'd always work out in my mind a quick route and excuse to go to a certain place, and I would not threaten them or say anything to them, committing myself until I was sure there was no one around in the immediate area. Just in case they did panic and scream or yell or try to jump out, I always locked the door from the inside by placing the broken window turning knob from my side of the door into the opening mechanism on the passenger side, which was not accessible from the inside of the car. And I would open the door from the inside for these people to show the lock right after opening it. And they'd never try it after they get in. They would just get in and that would be that. Oh. I would not produce the weapon. Usually it was always a gun. I would never produce a weapon until I was sure that from then on in I had it pretty well licked, the whole situation. From that point on I would take absolutely no chances if I didn't have to, which unfortunately was kind of ego damaging because I would love to have been the big bad effective rapist or the effective male ego type where I could be in control of the situation without a weapon. I usually put the weapon away, but let them know it was right there. But I would have to leave the area quickly. I would have to put them in the trunk or tie them up in some way that they couldn't, when I'm not looking, to harm my plan. At that time, they wouldn't know what it is. They would never know they were going to die until they were under attack physically. I always promised this. Only in the case of the first two girls did I actually say that they were going to be raped. And that was way out in the boonies, with nobody around and no driving to distract me. And even then, 
I didn't get to fulfill my promise. I would have loved to, but I realized at the time that I really couldn't. It was two people, and I realized I lived in a crowded apartment house, and it would be impossible to get them in and out without someone noticing it. There were too many risks, so they were killed on the spot. After that point, I realized that without someone else involved, it really couldn't be considered a rape situation because it's just too dangerous. I couldn't watch out for myself, and I couldn't do something like that out in the open because it's just way too chancy. So, the moment no one was around, the moment that was best to my advantage, the way I saw it, the victim would die, and being frustrated about the sexual end of the thing, sometimes sex was committed either during the death or after, but there were no sexual attacks or sexual assaults before unconsciousness was achieved in any of the cases. How do you feel about your mental abilities at the time of these killings? How do you mean that? Do you mean mental clarity? Yeah. Well, your reactions, your mental stability, do you feel that? Yes, I'm sure it happened before, but the only time I actually noticed an ejaculation was as I was killing Mrs. Hallett on Saturday night, as she was dying. It was a great physical effort on my part. Very restraining. Very difficult. Much less difficult than I made it. I went into a full, complete physical spasm, let's say. I just completely put myself out on it, and as she died, I think with a coup girl, in the case of a suffocation, the same thing happened. But I didn't really notice it, because I did have sex with her right after causing her to be unconscious. Could you possibly relate the reasoning behind the dissecting of the bodies, and the decapitations? Yeah, originally the decapitations... I think part of it was kind of a weird thing I had in my head. It was a fantasy I'd had in childhood. I don't know where it came from, but it was always something I'd wanted to do, and it did facilitate part of my plan later. That is, if someone was found, they would be harder to identify. I figured that the more odds that there were in my favor, the better. There would be just as many odds that they'd find parts of the body as they would find the head, which would be the easiest to identify but there was satisfaction gained in the removal of the head. In fact, the first head I had ever removed was that of Miss Lucessa in the trunk of the car with the knife that killed Miss Peace, and I remember it was very exciting removing Miss Lucessa's head. There was actually a sexual thrill, and in fact, there was almost a climax to it. It was kind of an exalted, triumphant type thing, like taking the head of a deer or an elk, or something would be to a hunter. I was the hunter, and they were my victims. Another thing that comes to my mind, is the fact of a time span between several of the victims, something as much as what, three months? What would be the reason for that? Part of it was fear, some of it was regret, other parts of it were the opportunities. I didn't just rush out and look for the opportunities. If you'll notice, there was a greater time span between the first and second, and the second and third, than there was anywhere else. But I had started to really get into gear towards the end there. I was getting what I think is sicker, and it was much more of a need for more of the blood. And the, the blood got in my way. It wasn't something I desired to see. Blood was an actual pain in the ass. What I wanted to see was the death, and I wanted to see the triumph, the emulation over the death. It was like eating, or a narcotic something that drove me more and more and more. When I had the 22, it facilitated the quacking. It stepped everything up, made it much simpler, much quicker, much easier, less of a threat to me personally. I was less afraid to attack. I don't like attacking people. I would have been in bar fights and street fights and would have been physically and verbally assaulted. These I wasn't. It was a matter of I didn't care how I got there, I just wanted the exultation over the other party. In other words, winning over death. They were dead and I was alive. That was the victory in my case. I suppose I could have been doing this with men, but that always posed more of a threat. They weren't nearly as vulnerable and that would have been quite odd and probably noticeable, picking up other men and having them killed. Plus. Like in this case where sex is involved, or the thrill of having a woman around, alive and dead, wasn't there with a man. So, like I said before, 
there was a threat of the possible retaliation or the possible defense that could throw me off, and after I'd broken my arm, this was absolutely unthinkable. So it wasn't just deaths that I wanted. It was, like I said, somewhat of a social statement in there too, and I was jumping upon. I could have gotten children, I suppose. Children are vulnerable, but there are two things against that. One is most important. That is that children are innocent. Children are unknowing. And I've always been very protective of children for that reason. I was very sensitive as a child about the treatment I got and the treatment other children got. And these girls weren't much more than children, I suppose. But I felt, accepting the Aiko Ku case, I felt that they were old enough to know better than to do the things they were doing and what they were doing when they were out there hitchhiking, when they had no reason or need to, was that they were flaunting in my face the fact that they could do any damn thing they wanted, and that society is as screwed up as it is. So that wasn't a prime reason for them being dead. It was just something that would get me a little uptight. The thought of that, then feeling so safe in a society where I didn't even feel safe. Let me ask you one question, Ed, on the theory you have of eliminating evidence. Have you ever done anything to a person's body, or head, to totally... Yeah, now you're talking about the Aiko Ku case. That occurred somewhat after the discovery of Miss Peace's head. Even though it was quite some time before the authorities discovered exactly who it was, I realized from the paper accounts that it was quite difficult because of the time it had been out in the hills... This gave me the idea of disfiguring the head enough to where it would be even more difficult to discover the identity, thus giving me a longer time for any possible mistakes to correct themselves, due to time or whatever. In her case, Miss Coos, after she was dead, there was some time between the disposal of her body portions and the head and hands. The hands by that time were, let's say, the tips of the fingers were distorted enough by normal deterioration that I wasn't worried about fingerprints by the time they could be found. So the head I removed the hair from, very noticeable long dark hair, and cut it short with a knife, but not so short that it would seem to be that of a man's or a boy's. I also removed the teeth from the head, because this was one of the prime methods of identification on a head, that is, dental chart comparisons. How did you remove the teeth from the head? I used a chisel-type tool, a screwdriver and a hammer, and not striking hard. I just struck them over the face on the enamel portion, and this would pull the tooth and the root out of the head, out of the gums. About how long after decapitation did this occur? It happened, let's see. She was killed Thursday night. Friday, she was decapitated and cut up in Sunday night after I'd returned from Fresno and my sanity hearings. I removed the teeth from the head and the hair and deposited the head and the hands in Eden Canyon Road area. What was the purpose of keeping the head and the hands with you for this period of time? Well, like I said, I wanted to be more careful and take more time getting rid of those because if the other parts were found, it would be very likely or very possible that there would be a very difficult time in identifying the remains and time was almost always the most important thing. Because like I said, the time in my figuring was the more time in picking someone up and the more time between me depositing someone and them being found or discovered is more time for any possible identifications to be forgotten or for clues to be muddled up enough to where they wouldn't be of value to the police. April 29th, 1973. This is an extract from Kemper's confession regarding the murder of Aiko Ku. She didn't realize that there was a serious, serious problem until after we passed the town of Half Moon Bay, and at that point, she kept looking at her watch and saying, Well, I've only got 15 minutes to get there. Ten minutes and five minutes, and at two minutes after eight exactly, she said, Well, I'm late. I'm going to be late for my class. And at this point, I had been balking at saying anything. But at this point, I told her that she wouldn't be making her class tonight. And with a worried tone, she said, What do you mean? I said, I'm not taking you to San Francisco. At that point, she didn't shriek, but she, like, covering her head and moving away from me, 
She was in her seat belt, and I was in mine. She was shaking her head and holding her arms up and saying, No, no, and almost shrieking, Don't kill me, please. And I started shaking her and told her to knock it off, and I wasn't going to hurt her. She kept doing it, so I reached under the seat and picked up the gun I had under the seat, which was a Colt Trooper 6-inch 357 Magnum that I had borrowed from a friend, him not knowing what I was using it for, and I poked this into her ribs and then asked her, Do you know what this is? I poked this into her ribs and then held it up in front of her. After two or three times doing this, she finally stopped this pleading not to kill her and don't hurt her. I told her to calm down and talk with me, and she did. Right away, she stopped being nervous and upset, and we talked down the coast for the next few hours, or I'd say about a half an hour down the coast. And as we approached Santa Cruz after passing through Davenport, we turned up Bonnie Dune Road, the plan being that to avoid her possibly getting hurt and someone else trying to rescue a possible abduction. I told her I wanted to talk to her, and I was desperate. I needed someone to talk to to keep me from killing myself, which of course was a ruse. I said that it would be suspicious if she was sitting in the car with me and the neighbors would be alarmed, which of course is not true if she were in the car with me. So I wanted her to be in the back trunk to foil my plan. So she agreed with this, but she didn't want to get in the trunk. She asked if she could be tied up in the back seat instead, and I agreed. And we went to Bonnie Dune Road, from Highway 1 South, outside of Santa Cruz, to a point that I thought was desolate enough. I turned up Smith Grade Road. Now, was she tied up at this point? No, she was sitting in the seat with me, and she said, in fact, she still had her seatbelt on, and as we went upon Smith Grade Road, I noticed a little road that dropped down from the right, and this was pointing back towards Santa Cruz, I believe. Smith Grade Road was the way I was driving up it from Bonnie Dune Road. So, in other words, I was basically headed southeast on Smith Grade, I think, and headed down this little road to the right that lost sight of the road, stopped, turned off the lights, turned on the inside lights, and asked her to get the tape out of the glove box, her already knowing what was going to happen to a certain point. She got the tape out. I pulled a piece of it off and placed it over her mouth and told her to get in the back seat where I would tie her up and cover her over with a blanket. Did she help you in any way to put the tape on? Yeah, she got it out of the glove box for me, and when I pulled the tape open and tore off a piece, I placed it over her mouth and rubbed it on nice and tight, and got it on straight and everything, and asked her to blow against it, and move her mouth around to see if it would come off, and she assured me it wouldn't, following my instructions to the letter. I asked her to jump over the back seat, and she did. Then she went back over to the back seat and lay down on her back. At any rate... I got out of the car on my side, leaving the gun under the front seat on the driver's side, got out of my car, walked around to her side and realized that the keys being in my pocket, she had locked her side of the door when she got in, and it was still locked. At this point, I f started fumbling in my pants, trying to get the key out quickly before she realized the advantage she had, and when she saw that I was fumbling for the keys, she climbed back over the seat and flipped up the inside lock on her side letting me in. At this time, I moved the front seat forward and flipped the twin cushion front seat, flipped her cushion forward, climbed in the back seat. She was lying on her back with her hands across her stomach to be tied, and I asked her to turn over on her stomach, and she did, and put her hands behind her back. At this time, I tied her hands, and I took a lot of time doing it, because I was realizing that as soon as I was done tying her hands, that I had to kill her, or else take a chance on driving around town where someone could see her moving around under a blanket, or someone could stop me for a routine stop because my left tail light had been smashed out in an accident, and I did not want to be stopped for any reason with her in the back seat in her condition. So I fumbled around at tying her hands when I finally realized I was wasting my time and needed to get the thing done if I was going to do it. I turned wherever back gently on her back, as if I were going to place the blanket over her, and started to place my body over hers, on top of hers, actually. Placed my right hand firmly over her mouth from the right side. She was slightly curious at that point, wondering what I was doing, not at all worried or panicked. I then took my left hand, the thumb and index finger, 
reached around over her head and plugged both nostrils, pressed both nostrils closed, and for a moment there was actually no change in expression. Then she realized what was happening and she went berserk. She completely panicked and struggled violently for what I can only imagine to be a half of a minute, maybe 45 seconds, until she lost consciousness, possibly longer. But I don't think so because when I got up on her body, I heard quite an amount of wind being pushed out of her lungs by my weight, and I did not notice her sucking in a lot of air after that. How did she struggle in this 45 seconds? Very violently, her hands not being tied closely together. I tied her wrists separately by knots, and there was approximately six to eight inches of string or cord between the two knots, the two wrists. This gave her enough room to reach around her side and flip partially over on her side. Reach, and she grabbed at my testicles and penis in an effort to get me off and make me release her nostrils. Was she successful? She was at first, and I guess she didn't realize that she got me where she did. She kept grabbing and probing, and I think two or three times she grabbed me by the testicles or by the penis, and I broke away with that portion of my body and scooted it further down towards her legs, which means that less of my weight was positioned over her body, and her violent struggle got even more violent, and she moved around all over my back seat, kicking at the cushion on the far side, under the rear window, and kicking at the window right over her head even. I was trying to stay out of the way while this was going on with a major portion of my body, but I never let go of the grip on her nostrils or the tape over her mouth, and when the struggle stopped and she collapsed into the seat, I waited a few moments and then released her, leaving the tape on. You mean you released her nose? I released her nostrils, and she apparently was still breathing, but unconscious. At that time, I opened her right eyelid, I imagine, with my left hand, to see how unconscious she was, how much eye movement there was, and there was, I guess, a nominal amount of eye movement. It wasn't rapid. So apparently she was what I thought deep asleep or unconscious, and after a few moments of watching this, the eye movement, the eye zeroed in on me, and then her other eye thrust open, and she started her movement again. For a moment, she just looked at me, and I guess she became conscious enough to where she remembered what was happening and went right back into the extreme panic she had been in. And the whole process started over again for just about the same amount of time, identical to the other 45 seconds. Every move, I mean, still grabbing at my testicles and still grabbing at my body. What did you do? Were you still pinching her nose? Yes, this time I held her nose until all of the voluntary breathing was done, she was into great deep gasps with her lungs. Her back was arching, unconscious, but the breaths became fewer and far between, and she was still in a spasm-type breathing. Did you still have your fingers over her nose? Yes, and at that point I stopped because I knew she wouldn't wake up soon. I picked her up from the back seat, took her out of the car, around the back behind the trunk, thrust her body down on her back on the ground, and pulled her pants down violently, not removing them, but pulling them down below the crotch area, and spread her legs apart and forced sexual intercourse on her. And I achieved orgasm, and I guess it was in 15 or 20 seconds. It was very quick. At that time, I noticed her hair falling over her face and nose. She was still breathing and starting to breathe again. I took the muffler that she had around her neck still and just wrapped it very tight and tied a knot in it, and her hands were still tied behind her back, and the tape was still over her mouth. At that time, I even choked her around the throat for a moment, but by that time, I was convinced that she was dead. Picked her up by the shoulders, and she wasn't a heavy girl. I think she told me she weighed 104 and a half pounds. I picked her up by the shoulders, and just, I think, I laid her across the open trunk, across half into the trunk while I did something else. I think I took the muffler off her neck, checked around to make sure nobody was coming, and made sure there was nothing lying around out on the ground, and then moved her all the way into the trunk, and wrapped the blanket around her that had been in the trunk. It was a blue velveteen blanket. This was the third murder, and I used one of the cords that night and destroyed it. The one I had her hands tied behind her back with, I later cut with a knife, rather than untie it. And this was after I put her in the trunk, closed the lid, 
drove down the road. I stopped to make sure she was dead, got out, went around and checked for a heartbeat. I couldn't really feel her hands, her extremities to see if they were cold without moving her body. So I turned her over, cut the cords, threw the cords off the side of the road in some bushes, and pulled her hands out and around and put them across her chest, and the fingertips were cold, and the hands had already changed from her normal body temperature of the rest of her body. Was this before, or after, you stopped for a beer up there? That was before. Then I next stopped at a little bar up on Bonnie Dune Road for a couple of beers. Also, to check to see how apparent my whatever was, grief, excitement, exultation, anxiety, whatever was showing, I wanted to test on these people in the bar and correct it before I went any farther. Besides, I was hot, tired, and thirsty. I went inside the bar. Actually, I stopped and opened the trunk to check to make sure she was dead, not moving, not breathing. Closed the lid, went into the bar. I had, I think, three beers, maybe only two. Washed my hands in the washroom and left. Again, checking in the trunk, satisfied that she was dead. I suppose as I was standing there looking, I was doing one of those triumphant things too, admiring my work and admiring her beauty, and I might say, admiring my catch like a fisherman. Closed the lid, got back in the car, drove to Santa Cruz out to Aptos, where I stopped in my mother's home at 609A Ord Street, went inside the house, talked to my mother for approximately half an hour about non-essential things, just passing the time, telling her why I was down from the Bay Area, which was a lie, a fabrication, testing on her whether or not anything would show on my face or my mannerisms or speech as to what I was doing and why, and it didn't. She absolutely took no alarm or asked any undue questions. I left her home, and by then it was probably 9.30 at night. Before I got into the car, I looked in the trunk again, again admiring my catch, knowing already she was dead, feeling her body to see which parts were still warm, partially out of curiosity, wrapped her body up very firmly in the blanket, because there was a big hole in the back that would suck dust and road dirt and things in. The trunk was a very dirty area, and started driving again, this time towards Oakland, up Highway 17 going to Alameda. I arrived there, I think it was 10.30 or 11, probably 11. Took her book bag and also the little hat and hat tie that she had had there into the house, up into my apartment. Checked it over to see, make sure. Now, you've told us before that this was the first body that you dismembered. Yes, it was. At this time, I had broken my arm June 28th in a motorcycle accident. Quite severely, my forearm, and I had a steel plate four inches long with six one-inch screws through the bone, holding it in place, but it was still broken, and it was quite painful to use it to any extent, and it was quite an effort to carry her up to my apartment from the trunk, and I knew, not so much from the pain of carrying her, but I knew it would be very difficult to carry her back down out of the apartment. I was quite fortunate to get up there without anybody seeing me. It was late at night, at least midnight, so I decided the only safe way to take her out of the apartment was to dismember her body and take her out in some form of container. The only container I could see that would be bloodproof, waterproof, and would not give away what was in it would be a large green heavy plastic garbage bags. I bought, I think, two big packages, boxes of these bags. Was this before you or after you? This happened on a Thursday night and Friday. I called in sick and then went down to a store and purchased these bags. Where was her body in the meantime? You mean Friday? Friday. I had it on my bed in my apartment. It was a Murphy bed. I was in a studio apartment. I hid the body well in several places. I had it on the couch laying down and on the bed and possibly at one time in the closet in case someone would come up there when I was gone. Had the body, in any way, been dismembered at this point? No. Did it have any clothes on? No. Regarding the confession tapes, Kemper was asked about the effects of playing them in court. His response. It's an awfully touchy subject, you know. What happened and what didn't happen. Still, it's going to be awfully terrible for the family to have to listen to just because 
they are in court, you know. Because I've heard of things like where certain tapes are played just in front of the judge or just in front of the jury as evidence, rather than just play it in front of the whole court. That starts to look like a whole arena, you know. And everybody is in there to hear all the gory details. That would get me very upset, and I'd probably ask to leave the court. The judge would say, no, you're going to sit there and listen. Then I'd start throwing chairs and having a fit, scream on the floor and all that stuff. Kemper was asked by his attorney, Jim Jackson, during his trial, if he ever disclosed his dark fantasies to the staff at the psychiatric hospital. He said, no, I would never have got out if I had told psychiatrists I was having fantasies of sex with dead bodies and, in some cases, eating them. I would never have gotten out, ever. Jackson said, Wow, that's like condemning yourself to life imprisonment. And I don't know many people who do that. Kemper said, I hid it from them. They can't see the things going on in my mind. All I had to do to conceal it from them was not talk about it. Ed Kemper was evaluated by psychiatrists and declared to be sane. He was found guilty on eight counts of first-degree murder. He received a life sentence for each charge to be served concurrently. He tried to commit suicide four times in jail, but later resigned himself to his fate. He has been denied parole repeatedly. His next parole hearing is in 2024, when he will be 75 years old. Ed Kemper lives in the general population and has been described as a model prisoner. He has made productive use of his time in prison by volunteering as a professional narrator of audiobooks. Including among the titles are Flowers in the Attic, The Glass Key, The Rosary Murders, and the novelization of Star Wars. Many of these audiobooks are enjoyed by the blind. I have known many blind people, but I have always neglected to mention that these stories may have been read to them by a serial killer. In particular, I concealed this information from the blind women I knew. However valuable this public service may be, keep in mind that he is still the guy who said, One side of me says, Wow, what an attractive chick. I'd like to talk to her. Date her. The other side of me says, I wonder how her head would look on a stick. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.